everyone. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you at the International Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Law 2021 Doctoral Consortium. My name is Michał Araszkiewicz. Uh, I am an uh, assistant professor uh, in the Jagiellonian University in Kraków, uh, Poland. Uh, at the same time, I'm happy to serve on the executive committee uh, of the International Association for Artificial Intelligence and Law in the function of Secretary Treasurer. And in addition to this, I am pleased to have the function of the Doctoral Consortium Chair uh, at this edition of the conference. The Doctoral Consortium, the, the Doctoral Consortium is uh, a session which is dedicated to the presentation of the PhD projects of uh, young prospective scholars in the AI and law community. We are deeply convinced uh, that it is uh, essential to create a forum for our PhD students to present their research, especially if it is uh, on a relatively, relatively early stage of uh, development advancement in order to obtain a valuable feedback and increase the quality of the PhD project. Uh, the very idea of the doctoral consortium is not new. Typically, uh, so for many years, the doctoral consortium has been a part of our sister conference, EURIX, uh, the International Conference on Legal Knowledge and Information Systems. And here, uh, a word of appreciation is due to Professor Monica Palmirani, uh, who uh, initiated that project. Uh, to my memory, the first uh, ICAIL doctoral consortium was organized uh, as an accompanying event of the ICAIL in San Diego by Professor Monica Palmirani with the Governatory. Uh, it was 2015. Then in 2017, we had an edition co chaired by Professor Sparter High and with the Governatory. The last edition in 2019. Uh, in Montreal, and this edition in Sao Paulo, uh, are chaired by myself. Uh, so far, all editions of the doctoral consortium were considerably successful, uh, and there are high hopes that this edition will be no less successful than the previous editions. So good luck to all presenters. Uh, we have uh, we accepted 11 papers uh, to this uh, doctoral consortium. Uh, each paper is allocated with 30 minutes slots, uh, which enables a relaxed presentation uh, of the project uh, and uh, hopefully a fruitful discussion. So it is a time slot uh, identical to the time slot allocated to full papers during the main conference, uh, it is a very comfortable solution. So the discussions, uh, the discussions will be managed uh, by our colleagues from the uh, local organizing committee from Sao Paulo, um, as uh, it uh, used to happen during the main conference during the last three days. We are looking forward to a very uh, inspiring discussions to obtain good feedback, uh, valuable feedback from, from the community. Thank you very much. And uh, we may proceed to the third, first session, which uh, encompasses three papers. So I'm happy to hand over now to the session chairs. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the doctoral consortium. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first panel of the doctoral consortium. My name is Marcel and I will be your host uh, on this panel. Uh, first of all, uh, in name of the uh, IKE organization, I would like to deeply thank our platinum sponsors, Choose Brazil and Albert Einstein's Highly Hospital our gold sponsors, Logarithm, Legal Code, and PG Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, 
Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, Office of Boom Lawyers, and Oasis Open. Uh, that said, I would uh, like to give the floor to our first presenter, Ms. Diana Mokanu, uh, with uh, her paper called uh, Beyond Persons and Things, the Legal Status of Artificial Intelligence in the European Union. Uh, you have 20 minutes for your presentation, and I will send you a, a kind reminder when there's uh, two minutes left, okay? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and let me just share uh, my screen. Um, is that okay? Can you see it? See it? Yes, perfect. Uh, hello again, and uh, thank you for having me uh, at the uh, doctoral consortium of the International Conference of AI, uh, AI and Law. Uh, I am Diana Mocano, a PhD researcher at the Catholic University of Louvain uh, at the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research in Legal Sciences, and more specifically in the Center for Philosophy of Law. Um, and I will uh, be talking to, today about my uh, my doctoral uh, pro research project entitled uh, The Legal Status of Artificial Intelligence in the EU. Um, now, uh, having really only just started on what is already uh, shaping up to be quite a journey, I would like to first ask for, for your patience. Um, I'm, s I'm sorry, could I have your, oh, okay. Um, it didn't seem to, to go forward, forward. Okay, so I would like to first ask for, for a little bit of patience. Uh, I'm, I'm bound to have missed certain things. I have only just started last September on my doctoral uh, research. Uh, and secondly, I'll be more than happy to, to hear your questions and suggestions and they'll be uh, precious to my research, I'm sure. Um, and without further ado, um, there are, uh, a sh short terminology, um, pre uh, precision. Uh, I will be throughout this presentation talking about AI systems, and I chose this uh, terminology based on uh, Euro the European Commission's uh, latest uh, uh, AI um, regulation proposal. Um, there are, as you can see on the screen, quite a quite a few other uh, other term terminological uh, choices that I could have gone with, but I, in the framework of my research, I've chosen uh, the, the latest, this latest one, which is of course, um, not to say that it's the best, it's just a, it's just a, a contextual choice. Um, so without further ado, there are notoriously many legal issues raised by, uh, by these uncanny entities. Um, so it seems only a matter of time uh, before the first hard cases involving them would start to, start to appear before European courts and courts in general, which will doubtlessly require answering some very difficult questions, um, chief among which uh, concerning the legal status of, uh, of AI systems. On the answer to this central question, a host of consequences depend, or rather this answer determines what legislation will be applicable and enforceable in relation to the practical uses and the ensuing consequences of those uses of AI. And there are, in my opinion, three possible answers to this. So the law could either treat AI as things, they could consider them persons, or they could create a new sui generis legal status um, for uh, AI systems. Um, I will attempt to answer this question by basically, or the plan is to answer this question by systematizing the arguments in favor of and against each of the three options that I listed before, to critically analyze those arguments that I have identified to contribute new ones, um, hopefully. And um, all this is uh, in order to sort of um, flesh out a portrait robot of the legal status of what uh, of what the legal status of AI systems should look like in the EU. Um, so the proposed research um, contends to systematize these arguments and what is at stake here is not only the legal regime applicable to AI systems to their use and the consequences of that use but also the coherence of juridical humanism itself. And I will 
explain why that is. It has been argued that the current form of juridical humanism widely accepted in Western legal systems and based on the dualistic division of reality into persons and uh, things is incoherent. And this incoherence stems in part from, um, from um, the dereification of animals. So the fact that animals are no, are no longer considered at, as things. Um, why so? Well, shortly put, because according to the modern theories of rights, animals are either already hold legal rights regardless of whether they are defined as, as legal persons because we have legal duties towards them, such as the duty not to mistreat them. Um, and this is because um, the paradigm paradigmatic theory of legal personality man maintains that a legal person is someone or something that holds legal rights and or duties. Oh, and so this is the first, uh, the first uh, option or animals cannot hold rights regardless of whether they're declared legal persons. And this is according to the will theory of rights, um, but neither can according to this, uh, to this theory, for instance, small children who are nonetheless widely taken to be legal persons. So juridical humanism has been criticized. And uh, moreover, um, certain views such as ecocentric anthropism has been proposed to replace the anthropocentrism that is inherent in juridical humanism. And uh, I won't go into details, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a sort of more holistic view of uh, uh, of a system that that does not place the human at the center of everything, but uh, is sort of in a, a web of relations uh, with the environment and um, other entities. Um, and we see that this answer to the status question of AI systems seems to depend on larger questions on our perspective of the law in general, or this, the, the context, which can either be represented by juridical humanism or not, as we have seen, or on whether one approaches law from a different perspective, such as maybe systems theory or functionalism or naturalism or legal positivism. And to give just one example of approaching law from systems theory, um, this would mean um, espousing the view that there is no compelling reason to restrict attribution of action exclusively to humans and to social systems, and that other entities can also um, be attributed action. Um, and um, the background for this is ex exactly the technologically triggered um, tendencies in private law that towards objectivization and de-psychologization. Um, this is uh, Gunther Twimmer's systems theory approach, uh, which specifically applied to AI systems would mean that their social identity and their ability to act would make them through social act action attribution member, non-human members of society. And the point is that their legal status should reflect this. Otherwise gaps would arise and there would be not only gaps in responsibility as we have recently heard quite a lot, uh, but also different kinds of, of gaps that cannot effectively be patched with traditional conceptual instruments. And his answer to the status question is three-pronged. So basically he suggests three uh, solutions. Either we can think of AI systems as actors with limited legal subjectivities uh, or actants, uh, very much alike with the with the what uh, what Bruno Latour said uh, in his actor network theory, they could uh, they could be treated as hybrids or a member of a human computer association or very much more um, um, vaguely as an element of, of a risk risk pool. But surely uh, they are man made artifacts, and we cannot forget that they are. However, they're also autonomous, adaptive, and self-learning. And these feature matters matter because they are highly anthropomorphic characteristics, which are generally uncommon in mere things. And they are 
autonomous in the sense that they have the capacity to initiate change and their own uh, changes in their own program in order to better achieve certain goals. They're not entirely predictive, predictable and they're not defined in a closed manner. So they're underdetermined. This is uh, the uh, terminology um, employed by, uh, by Hildebrand and Coops um, to uh, clarify the salience of autonomy. And then they are agents in the sense that they make decisions and they take actions in the world in order to achieve goals. And ontologically speaking, there's no difference between attribution of agency to humans and to other I agents. So the question becomes, is, is it desirable to attribute agency to AI systems? And some say that it is, and some say that this leads to attributing personhood. And the European Parliament had itself in 2017 uh, said so. Uh, it has suggested that uh, creating a specific legal status for, in that case, robots would be um, a desirable thing, might be a desirable thing. Um, in what concerns personhood, we should, however, be very aware of the fact that person, the concept of person is a very abstract and ambiguous one itself. There are at least three different senses in which we can talk about personhood. And the one that I am referring to here is legal personhood. Uh, legal personhood, which can either be attributed to humans, uh, like the natural sort of personhood that we attribute to humans with the uh, not quite and not very um, insignificant asterisk of, of it being denied certain humans a, a long history. Um, and then legal personhood, uh, the type that is usually uh, associated with cor corporations. Um, okay. Um, there is also a very, um, very important distinction to, to be made in legal theory about attribution or ascription of personhood. And the, there, there's a very uh, famous debate between formalism and realism on whether there is or not a preliminary condition which is necessary for, for the recognition or ascription of personhood. Uh, basically, a realist said that there is, and that condition, that condition can be either a soul, dignity, reason, or a sentience, or the ability to suffer, etc or that there isn't, and then the question becomes, what is legal personhood then? Or how do we think about legal personhood in terms of, uh, uh, of concepts? Um, as for AI systems, the interest in the subject specifically, um, to my knowledge, um, has its debut in 92 with Professor Larry Solom's uh, seminal article on legal personhood for artificial intelligences. Uh, which bears noting that, well, in 1992, there was little to talk of in terms of artificial intelligence, which arguably might still be the case, but um, it didn't uh, mean that there was no further interest in the subject. On the contrary, um, it led to the development of a so-called relational approach, which we owe uh, as a concept to Professor Mark Kokelberg, which I forgot to cite on my slide, um, but also, um, and so this uh, relational uh, approach um, means that basically uh, the recognition of legal personhood for AI systems is linked to the condition that these agents must fit within our, um, our networks, our social networks, political, economic re relations, etc. cetera. Uh, and inter interest in the subject has been growing exponentially lately, uh, especially um, due to Professor David Gunkel's robot rights movement, which has garnered a lot of support for and against. Um, again, I won't go into much detail here, suffice it to say, uh, there, are, there is a, a very fruitful ongoing debate uh, resulting in quite a few publications, uh, mostly last year and this year that I have uh, briefly listed here. Uh, so surprisingly, um, I had started uh, on this subject uh, w with the, the impression that there is not much literature, literature to talk about, uh, but lately that has come to change. So uh, in 
legal theory um, and legal theory specifically, there there is one um, quite recent book from 2019, uh, Visakurki's A Theory of Legal Personhood, which proposes a new uh, bundle theory uh, of uh, of legal personhood, defining it as a bundle of interconnected incidents. So incidents are basically more complex. Um, well, more. Hmm. There are there are, um, groups of rights, so to say, much in the way that um, property was uh, was described as a bundle of uh, more simple rights, um, and um, this means that entities such as AI systems and the book treats uh, dedicates a whole chapter to the to this uh, problem to the problem of AI systems. Um, they could be treated as more or less. Uh, more or less as persons um, based on the composition of the specific bundle of rights that are attributed to it. And uh, it also uses the concept of legal platform to the case of AI system, for the case of AI systems, which I won't try to explain uh, mainly because I'm not sure of having uh, completely understood it myself, which I'm hoping to, to solve by, um, by inviting the, the, the author to 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 a webinar uh, in our research center, uh, and uh, to to go on um, as I said before, but surely there are man-made artifacts, aren't they? And this is seems to be the opinion that a, quite a an impressive number of uh, scientists and um, AI professionals and academics have taken ever since two thousand seventeen and with the with the European Parliament's proposition. Um, there are nothing more than tools and legal personhood is an inappropriate, both legally and ethically, whatever the status model they say. Um, and this seems to, to be the case for most European Union um, uh, regulation attempts. Uh, so the white paper on AI from 2018 does not identify legal personhood of AI systems as a problem. So no change is proposed. Uh, the 2020 resolution of the European Parliament thinks it's not necessary to give legal personality to AI systems, although it stresses that they are very high risks, a risk, and the fact that high risk is connected to their increasing level of autonomy. And indeed, uh, this year in April, with the with the proposed AI regulation, the tendency to rely on existing interpretation of, of law instead of innovating in terms of legal status, of course, is once again, apparent. Um, so it just tacitly seems to be considered too much of a leap to, to give a different legal status than that of objects to AI. And uh, I've been recently uh, made uh, quite aware of the fact that we should not underestimate the possibility that no clear course of action uh, will ever be chosen in European uh, Union instruments. Um, and that personhood might well be too much of a leap as opposed to just tinkering with liability solutions uh, with the liability solutions that we have and just sort of wishfully thinking that we'll be able to attribute whatever harm will possibly arise to existing categories of natural and legal persons. Um, last but not least, the, my third proposed uh, solution, uh, so a sui generis legal status for AI systems, um, seems to uh, count uh, a wide range of, um, of uh, solutions from speci attributing specific rights, which sort of uh, would mean attributing personhood with, if, we, uh, if we rely on the, on the definition of personhood that I've come to, that I've just uh, quoted um, from the new theory. Uh, then a partial legal capacity instead of uh, uh, personality was proposed as well uh, to do with the specific function that they they um, they have. Uh, also, endowing AI with legal subjectivity was proposed. So yet again, different from legal personality or making them non-personal subjects as well. This all seems very complicated and uh, well, maybe unnecessarily so. Uh, and it's something that I'm tackling in my. Uh, hopefully forthcoming publication in Frontiers of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, uh, sort of right gradient theory of legal status, um, to uh, yeah, of which I have to only... You have uh, two minutes, okay? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry.
Um, so I've included a, a, a Venn diagram of um, which asks the question where where on this diagram would we include uh, AI to hopefully make it clearer um, how the conceptual map of, of legal personhood or legal status in general uh, would look like. Mm. To um, conclude and to systematize a little, we have uh, different types of arguments. So we have moral and psycho philosophical arguments of, of who counts as a moral subject worthy of consideration and what remains mere property. We have conceptual arguments about, well, basically conceptually engineering uh, legal personhood and legal status uh, to go to a more general level. And then we have pragmatic, uh, arguments of what is instrumental to promoting some kind of human good more effectively. Um, the arguments relate to either the nature uh, of AI, so philosophy of technology, uh, they relate to the nature of legal concepts like personhood, so legal ontology, uh, and the nature of the relationship be between the two, so uh, legal theory. Um, they explore whether legal status attribution is based on pre-existing characteristics or if it's simply legal artifice. They question the conceptual coherence of juridical humanism and attempt to place it on maybe firmer theoretical ground. And they assess the practical implications of each course of action, each of the three courses of action um, possible in the case of the legal status question. Uh, I will focus on law in general and theories about law uh, or about what law necessarily is, but I will draw examples primarily from uh, legal traditions of EU member states and positive law, uh, and I will limit the scope to the uh, legge ferenda suggestions to the EU. Uh, there's uh, going to be an interdisciplinary layer, of course, uh, which is uh, uh, which comes with the territory of the subject matter, I think. Um, and uh, this is all from me. I look forward to your questions and thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you so much, Diana. Uh, I have our first question here. Uh, could you elaborate on what a third option, uh, AI as a sui generis, could look like? Uh, well, uh, just to finish the question, is a quite long question. <laughs> uh, if we are to create a legal fiction for AI, would this be similar to a corporation, for instance? If we were to create a legal fiction, AI as sui generis, such as the case for corporations, does the legal concepts about personhood, thinghood, still matter as much? Well, I think they do matter. Um, and I think they, they matter in the sense that they, um, maybe that they are sort of road signs or um, they are useful in delimiting uh, or in, how should I put it, in um, creating sort of a framework. So in what I propose uh, as a gradient theory of uh, legal status, um, basically the point is that you could be more or you could have more or less of a status in, in, in fun uh, as a function of, uh, of certain characteristics that, or you, uh, I should say AI systems would have more or less of a legal status. And that legal status would vary much like in the case of uh, an RGB led, uh, I don't know if you can visualize that, but sort of, um, legal status would vary between cert three, two, three <laughs> um, uh, fixed points. So basically personhood, uh, thinkhood, and then a, a something in between and then outwards sort of. Um, I should probably make a, make a visualization of that to make it more, um, uh, uh, to make it clearer. Um, I think I've answered the question. I'm not very sure, but um, a sui generis legal status for AI is, is very is a very uh, vague idea. Still, there is very little work on it. Although there are propositions, like I listed the four different types of uh, propositions to deal with uh, uh, with uh, AI systems in a sui generis matter manner. Um, one of them, which I did not go into detail about, is uh, the legal subjectivity one. Um, so 
that that's a very a very new proposition from a Polish scholar, um, Sylvia Wojciech, uh, I think, um, if I'm pronouncing the the name right, uh, which basically uh, joins my idea about um, about a gradient of uh, of legal personality. Just doesn't call it a gradient as my uh, per se, uh, but it's basically uh, centered on. Um, on this idea of uh, gradualized or attributing or taking away rights in um, as um, to match uh, the function of uh, AI systems. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for another question. Um, how to handle the legal status of AI as a its liabilities in a very decentralized and collaborative uh, scenario network. In mm. other words, uh, frequently AI systems are composed of multiple algorithms, uh, database, and even multiple neural networks working together at the same time. Could one AI system be composed of multiple legal personalities? And if yes, how to determine which of them would be liable for uh, a specific event? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this uh, I think this uh, joins uh, uh, that idea that I cited from G G Gunter Teubner's um, uh, systems theory approach, uh, in which he said that basically AI systems could be uh, treated as members of a risk risk pool. I don't know if you recall in my pre presentation. Uh, I did not make a very big point about it, but um, it seems to be very vague in his writings as well. So basically he doesn't actually tell us how that would be feasible in practice. Probably, um, probably it would, well, most likely it wasn't the subject of the, the, uh, the article that I cite uh, for this purpose. But the point there is that AI as members of risk tools could uh, foreseeable, foreseeably uh, be uh, treated in terms of liability and uh, responsibility as uh, a whole. So basically the whole risk pool should, uh, should um, be liable. We don't actually know about specific uh, details of uh, liability attribution or distribution, um, not from Gunter Twibner's in any case, but I'm more than happy to, to think about it. I'm actually probably going to have to, because as uh, you point out, and I don't know who the, who, the, uh, who uh, addressed this question, but uh, as you point out, there are increasingly many distributed uh, sort of applications of AI systems uh, that will require very, uh, very soon tackling this, this very issue. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, now we'll hand it to our second presenter. You, you. Maybe let's make. Uh, uh, excuse me. I think that we still have uh, like for uh, some minutes for for a question. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Monika Palmirani, who just joined our uh, doctoral consortium meeting here on Zoom. Uh, good morning, Monika. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, and we have a question here from, from, from Monica okay. in the chat. Uh, Monica, would you like to make yourself a question or may I read it for you? It's no, please, uh, you can coordinate, yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Monica. I have a question for um, the new proposal of AI, ECT, collocates the AI in the area of product connected with a large existing regulation about liability or CE certification of medical devices. How uh, your thesis could evolve to include also these new directions? Um, yes, and thank you for, for your question. Um, well, um, this will look, of course, uh, in the framework of my thesis be included in the, the section about thinghood. And, um, I, there's comparatively, comparatively little um, legal theory work done on what thinghood is, um, I think. Um, so hopefully by analyzing uh, the recent history of EU regulation on the subject of the AI systems and including uh, the, the most recent one, which is uh, this proposal for uh, an AI regulation that you uh, cite, um, 
Well, I would hope to uh, understand the sort of um, conception about AI systems that would permit me to uh, further the theorize. Um, it would include this, well, I don't know if it's a new direction per se, I wouldn't say so. I would say it's it's basically sticking with the status quo. So treating uh, technological development as things and attributing uh, strict liability to it or in the framework of, uh, of the 2020 uh, European Parliament uh, um, uh, Act, um, it would be basically uh, making a two-tier system of uh, of, uh, of liability based on high risk or ordinary risk, uh, as they call it, which in my opinion is uh, is a bad idea. It's just uh, treating very high risk things uh, with a sort of um, liability, um, uh, tre treating them, um, instead of treating them as strict liability subjects, as it would be um, according to the tradition of uh, technological development, they just, create this artificial two-tier system that sort of dampens some of the some some of the liability for ordinary risk AI. Um, so I'm hoping to integrate all of this into a bigger um, into a bigger picture about liability in general and how liability is used to uh, to treat uh, technological developments such as this, uh, these and how it evolves in itself, uh, liability I mean. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, and thank you, Monica, for your question. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Alexander Stepanov with her paper called The Digital Administrative Act. You also have 20 uh, minutes for your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so uh, I am a PhD researcher at the University of Rain in France uh, in the domain of uh, public law. And uh, my research paper is called the Digital Administrative Act. And I am happy to share it with you uh, at this doctoral consortium. Uh, so the present uh, PhD thesis in its second year of research the work is currently in the beginning of the writing phase, so that some preliminary, preliminary ideas and uh, conclusions may change later on. As uh, the main goal of research, I'd, I intend to find out how the implementation of artificial intelligence and other algorithmic systems in administrative decision-making can be adapted to the civil law system theory of unilateral administrative act and to the European legislation um, while respecting the rights of administrative citizens. Uh, the study is uh, predominantly of a legal nature. The application of AI in, in administrative procedure is examined from the perspective of law and legal theory. In order to achieve this objective, the author uses a number of legal research methodologies. So uh, a, sh a short uh, sketch of applied uh, research methodology. Uh, the thesis is based on the doctrine of French administrative law. The starting point are French public administra administrative legislation and the French theory of administrative unilateral act. The next step is uh, the emerging theory of the Digital Administrative Act in uh, French and foreign doctrine. Uh, comparative legal approach involves studying the legislation and jurisprudence of foreign countries, mainly from the civil law system, in the field of regulation of an administrative act involving AI. The most significant here is the German legislation and Italian jurisprudence. Uh, from the point of view of empirical approach, the most promising practices for introducing AI technologies into administrative procedures are investigated to better understand their operability in the public domain, as well as their compatibility with uh, legal theory requirements. Uh, from the point of view of analytical approach, the basic methods of legal reasoning are analyzed, the deductive inference on the basis of uh, which rule-based systems works, as well as uh, the inductive inference used by machine learning systems. 
the thematic outline of the PhD thesis uh, and the main issues it explores are determined uh, by the classical definition of an administrative act in French law, which can be reduced to a legal act which emanates from administrative authority and has the value of enforceable decision. In other words, uh, it is uh, the result of an intentional application of a legal syllogism to resolve a specific legal issue. Its uh, peculiarity is uh, the authoritative nature of the decision taken by the competent administrative authority, which is binding on citizens regardless of their consent. In addition, citizens often have no alternatives but to turn to state institutions for their needs, like uh, acquisition of permits, uh, benefits, licenses, etc. Uh, because of its binding nature and the need to ensure a certain level of guarantees against arbitrariness, the Administrative Act is subject to the principle of legality under control of the judge. Its uh, requirements reflect the process of adopting uh, unilateral administrative acts which is a combination of both objective and subjective legal aspects. Uh, the former includes primarily the premises of legal syllogism, while the latter are related to the final decision and direct application of the law. And uh, I'll, I'll start my presentation by uh, objective aspects uh, and uh, legal syllogism in the administrative decision, uh, which started by a law fighting by a public algorithm. The translation of administrative law norms into code language is required to interpret the inputs and legally qualify them for the purpose of adjudicating an administrative act. In the context of administrative law, two main approaches uh, to the coding uh, of administrative rules can be distinguished. Uh, the first approach is to directly um, uh, translate uh, the legal norms into the language of a programming code on the basis of which the rule-based systems that embodies the public algorithm operates. In general, this type of reasoning is closer to individual administrative decisions, which are made based on the applicant, applicant's compliance with the requirements listed in the law. This model has a number of drawbacks, the main one being the lack of plasticity of expert systems. However, it's still the most widely used model in administrative law. Moreover, the principle of legal certainty and predictability of decisions is one of the main principles in administrative law and rule-based AI systems should remain a priority. Uh, it is worth noting that the current practice of uh, different countries uses not only the model where an existing normative act is translated into code, a number of countries are currently exploring the possibility of the adoption of legislative and regulatory acts at once in machine-readable form, parallel to the textual form. That is simultaneous approbation of their program expression. It is supposed that such a model could give public algorithms more legitimacy in uh, their interpretation of the law. Uh, the second approach involves uh, the use of machine learning systems that based on the learning sample, for example, analysis of administrative files with predictable results on them, could themselves uh, make decisions similar to those made by a human agent. Uh, rules uh, formulated by AI itself based on correlations could be said to reflect the legal rules, standards, and principles of law applied in making the category of administrative act. In such way, machine learning algorithms could be used as a risk assessment, predictive and decision support tools. At the same time, decisions made by machine learning algorithms are not transparent and therefore unpredictable and often, often unexplainable. Albeit the fact that the explainability and comprehensibility of algorithmic administrative decisions is one of the fundamental principles of French administrative law in particular due to the right of concerned citizen to obtain communication of the rules defining the algorithmic processing. On this account, the French Constitutional Council has effectively banned the use of algorithms that can evolve and change their own logic and in administrative decision-making. Uh, next, we'll examine uh, a fact-finding stage uh, and the main issue addressed in the question of where 
and how the AI algorithms will take input data for their preparation of draft administrative decisions. As there are primarily individual administrative acts, the main inputs are the documents provided by the applicants. In this context, the digital identity of citizens plays here a major role and allows for the acquisition and verification of a considerable amount of data required for decision-making. At the same time, it carries with it a treat to individual rights and freedoms. In France, uh, the first attempt to create a centralized data system called Safari uh, resulted in public censure and its rollback. This is why a new platform, France Connect, is now being established on the basis of the principle of decentralized data storage. Another important source of input data is the data flow between different authorities and even corporations. The missing data could presumably be obtained from scans of doc documents provided by the applicant, information from which could be extracted by machine learning algorithms that could also verify their uh, authenticity. As far as administrative regulatory acts are concerned, the use and analysis of public big data is promising to determine the optimal regulations in the various areas, such as urbanism, transport systems, the education systems, in particular to inform the administration about a need for a new act. But uh, administrative decision is not just limited by objective uh, requirements, objective aspects, but it, it, is, it has also some uh, subjective aspects, uh, which is concerning the hu human participation in the um, decision-making. The first of them is the aspect of will, and in the civil law system, an administrative act, like any legal act, is an expression of will. That is, is uh, expressed through the intention to produce a legal effect. Uh, in the case of the implementation of AI in the automated adoption of administrative acts, the question arises as to whose will the algorithm express and whether they express it at all since the AI itself does not possess consciousness and its own will. In the study, the following concept of algorithmic will is presented uh, within a legal act, administrative will can be conditionally divided into internal, uh, so, or the intention to adopt an administrative act, and the external, or the volition itself, the explicit expression of the intention. In this case, uh, the source of the intentional will is uh, the state, which has incorporated the intention in the text of, of the law, and the public administration, which acts in pursuance of this law. The AI algorithm is given the role of expressing the external will, which makes the kind of agent that acts according to the will on behalf and in the interest of the administration that implemented it. Therefore, uh, the active participation of the administration in uh, the development of an algorithm is particularly important in order to convey the legal will as precisely as possible in the line of code. Thus, uh, the process of shaping the administrative will moves from the adoption of the administrative act to the, to the development and the uh, adoption of uh, the public algorithm designed to express it. Uh, and from the point of view of other uh, subjective aspect, uh, aspect of discretion in the Digital Administrative Act, the non-discretionary nature of an administrative act is uh, the most common and most sensible of the criteria that determine the admissibility of AI in automated administrative decision-making. Uh, non-discretionary decisions, uh, such as the issuance of certificates and permits, uh, which imply an obligation on the administration to adopt an administrative act if the factual circumstances meet the legal requirements uh, can be quite successfully fully automated, which would significantly speed up their adoption and uh, relieve uh, civil servants from a routine work. At the same time, uh, discretionary decisions where the decision-making body is authorized to assess the appropriateness of a particular outcome and where several compliant decisions are possible cannot be fully automated 
due to the uncertainty inherent in them. However, the problem is that the line between discretionary and non-discretionary acts is often not clear. There are only a small number of administrative acts whose adoption is conditional on the existence of unambiguous or numerically expressed facts. A certain amount of discretion can be contained in uh, an ambiguous term, like a reasonable period of case study, or the right to an agent's assessment of illegal facts, like interaction into French society, integration into French society uh, to get the French citizenship. Uh, the study argues that the totality of administrative acts cannot be binned into discretionary and non-discretionary categories. Rather, it can be argued that there is a certain degree of discretion in the adoption of each individual administrative act, the zero point of which is a fully bound administrative act that is strictly and unambiguously regulated by law and devoid of any evaluation. A greater degree of discretion implies a greater degree of ambiguity and variability in the legal facts uh, governing the decision, as well as the decision itself. Consequently, the greater the degree of discretion of the act to be taken, the more difficult it is for the AI system to model its adoption, and the less decisive a role in decision-making it can be given. Uh, Thus, um, the concept of uh, the degree of participation of algorithms in administrative decision-making procedure can be represented as ratio of two axes. The higher the discretionary nature of the administrative act, the less significant the role of the algorithm can be in it. Moreover, depending on the degree of discretionality of the act to be taken, uh, the preferred technology of AI changes uh, accordingly from rule-based system to machine learning algorithms used by administrations in the presence of wide discretion as a decision support tool, not binding this administration in any way. Between two examples, countless administrative acts can be identified as well as combination of different kinds of AI systems optimal for their adoption. At the same time, the participation of a human agent in the adoption of an algorithmic administrative act cannot be completely ruled out. It is a necessary guarantee for its fairness and individualization, as well as respect for citizens' rights. Depending on the degree of algorithmization of the decision, one can imagine many types of such participation, like monitoring automated decisions, considering complaints against them, choosing one option from several offered, finalizing a half-finished administrative act, etc. However, the human agent may be influenced by a machine which he perceives as a source of objective information that defines his decision and whose principles of functioning are incomprehensible. In the context of discretionary acts, such influence can lead to the act being declared unlawful and judicially annulled, as it must be decided independently by a competent person. In order to avoid such a situation, it is recommended to pay more attention to the training of public agents in informatics up to including the official authorization to work with algorithms. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. attention. Uh, I, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, I have a first question from Mikhail. Um, are you going to take into account the case law of administrative courts as constraint uh, on administrative decision making? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I'm not very sure now because uh, as for French uh, jurisprudence, the decisions is uh, very rarely motivated uh, uh, the decisions of uh, French uh, uh, admi administrative um, courts uh, be because, because of, uh, and, and so it, it will be um, uh, difficult to extract a knowledge and uh, to construct administrative act uh, from, a jur from an administrative jurisprudence, but uh, the some con cons concepts can be extracted from this jurisprudence. Uh, I'm not still study this idea, but I will look at it anyway. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I also have a comment by Monica here. Uh, she stated, it's also interesting to see the use of the Article 22 of GDPR used in the case law in Italy. And she cites uh, a case law. You may find it in the chat. Uh, in the case of automatic decision system applied to the public selection of teachers in the Italy Italian school system of uh, the ministry. Uh, very interesting uh, thesis, she states also. Okay. Um, yes, I'm glad. Yes, uh, if I can answer the question here. Uh, yes, I have studied this article of, GP, of GDPR and uh, um, precisely in the context of uh, French law, uh, like uh, French law on uh, personal data, which has been adopted uh, in the uh, after the adoption of GDPR, uh, which now uh, legalize the individual administrative decisions uh, taken by administrative authorities. But uh, the, this criteria, like individual administrative decision, is uh, not uh, much uh, uh, correct uh, for, for a legalization because there are discretionary administrative de individual decisions who can't be now uh, well automated. And uh, for example, we could take another decision of uh, Consiglio di Stato uh, it, it, it from Italy, uh, who uh, were the um, uh, Cons Consiglio di Stato uh, said that uh, it, is, um, it is much more relevant to automate the decision, uh, the repetitive decisions, which cannot uh, concern the uh, discretionary qualification of facts or choose between some opportunities. So uh, in, in Italy, it is also decided to legalize some more the non-discretionary decisions. Thank you. Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you. Um, I also have another question here. Um, how do no, it, it is the same. So I'm happy. Thank you so much for the answer. Okay, thank you, Monica. Uh, I have another one. Uh, how does French law deal with the gray area and the distinction between discretionary and non-discretionary decisions from the administration? If we include AI system to help make administrative decisions, do you think a specific regulation should apply or should we rely on past more general solutions? In fact, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the mm, previous version, not a version of this article, but a project of this this article uh, in the French uh, personal data protection law, uh, has uh, proposed a formulation that the administrative decision can be automated if there is no um, ambiguity on the qualification of the facts or there is no ambiguity on the qualification of the law. So uh, in my opinion, it should be um, uh, very precisely qualificated uh, not to um, stop the implementation of more uh, sophisticated algorithmic systems, but um, to, uh, to make some guarantee of respect of civil rights. And uh, no, for, for, from this purpose, uh, the uh, Constitutional Council of uh, French Constitutional Council has uh, banned the use of uh, machine learning systems, and uh, I think that with uh, pr more progress in uh, artificial intelligence development, these uh, re rules can be revised. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we have um, time for another one. Uh, um, it's very connected to the to the last one, but I think it's, it's uh, it has a, a little bit um, specification about uh, data uh, transfer between private actors and public actors. Um, you state in your paper that the use of analysis of uh, public big data to determine the optional regulation in various areas, such as urbanism, transport system, and so on, is promising, in particular to inform the administration about uh, a need for a new act. 
uh, how to regulate the access by the public administration to these databases? Uh, do you think that the public administration should have access to big data gathered by private actors like Uber and like in uh, the new events, uh, like the use of geolocalization data to control their compliance with social isolation measures to, during the pandemics? Uh, thank you for the question. In fact, I've told uh, much more about uh, public data, uh, so about data which is possessed already by the administration. Uh, like uh, state administration has a lot, uh, a kind of lot of data uh, who is delivered by the citizens, by the applicants, by the internal informational exchange. And it was primarily this domain of data, but in perspective, the um, conclusion of some information exchange between uh, the private uh, actors can be concluded. Uh, for example, as I said, for uh, extraction of legal facts, now, uh, for, uh, for example, for to, um, to prove your residence, uh, to prove your residence place, your address, you can now use an option to have a confirmation from your electricity uh, contractor that you live in here. And it, it is automatically going as a proof of your uh, residence. So in future, such, such a kind of uh, Coordinates between uh, public and private uh, actors in the domain of data can be enforced, I guess. Thank you so much. I, I asked this question, uh, this question because uh, it's very often, uh, it's coming very often here in Brazil to this kind of uh, trade on between data and, and so on, mainly during the pandemics. But uh, we also have a GDPR here in Brazil and you are very concerned about this traffic of data and so on. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, now I will handle uh, to Elizabeth Parr with uh, her paper called Constitutional Limits to the Use of Artificial Intelligence in Court Proceedings. Okay, you will have uh, 20 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm trying to share my screen. I hope it works. Can you see the PowerPoint now? Does it work? Okay, yes, perfect. perfect. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to speak here today. I'm very honored. Um, as you already pointed out, I'm running my uh, doctoral thesis on the constitutional limits of uh, law uh, of the use of AI in court proceedings. Um, and uh, I focus on civil proceedings. My dissertation is intended to contribute to the identification of the key constitutional challenges arising um, from the use of AI by courts and to also trace the limits of the capacity of constitutional law and I'm using Austria as an example, but I also hope that um, it is transferable to other legal orders that are based on the rule of law. Um, I, um, I hope it switched to the next slide. I think it did. Um, the starting point uh, of my dissertation is the more general observation that obviously technical developments in all conceivable forms and intensities have massively changed and shaped our society, especially in the last century, but that the process uh, uh, at a technical level is by no means at its limit. Um, especially with regards to digitization and optimization, um, there are many things happening um, with AI and particularly machine learning at the center of it. Um, society as a whole, I think, has on the one side high hopes uh, for AI to improve our lives um, in many fields and many ways, but at the same time, uh, I feel like there's a lot of skepticism. With regard to the legal sector, um, uh, it it has not been that profession that has been primarily associated with the use of new technologies. However, especially with regard to the potential of AI and uh, machine learning, um, the question at least consider uh, considering uh, partial substantiality of uh, 
lawyers uh, with AI is now being more and more discussed. However, um, the questions uh, mostly, at least in Austria, focus on uh, the factual implications of those technologies like job loss or how to finance them or the technical possibilities and limits. Um, and in depth uh, legal analysis from the constitutional perspective um, in Austria has not been uh, conducted. And I want to close that gap because I think it's very important. Um, the doctoral thesis um, pursues several aims. From a technical point of view, the current state of research in the field of AI and particularly machine learning shall be outlined. The focus uh, for me lies, as I said, on uh, self-learning uh, AI and therefore on machine learning. Um, then uh, this elusive techno technological phenomenon sh shall be uh, concretized by defining individual fields of application as the basis of the constitutional analysis. Um, and I intend to show uh, the strength, but also the weaknesses of uh, such technologies in court proceedings. Um, and due to these weaknesses, I think uh, the usage is already limited from a rather technical perspective before we even get to the constitutional analysis as such. Um, the overall objective uh, of this part is to counteract exaggerated expectations as well as unrealistic fears, um, which are very often articulated. The legal analysis of the doctoral thesis is intended to provide a more detailed assessment of the current constitutional framework with regards to the use of AI in civil court proceedings. Um, in order to achieve that goal, it is necessary to identify the essence of the potentially affected constitutional provisions and uh, to question the extent to which they are capable of capturing uh, the current technical phenomena. In the case I find gaps, uh, I will then try to determine whether and in which uh, direction an adaption is required. It should also be noted at this point that I do not pursue an all or nothing approach, and therefore um, I don't aim at qualifying AI as either entirely permissible or impermissible. This would be not reasonable, especially against the backdrop uh, of the diverse fields of application of AI and the uh, differentiated uh, constitutional regime we have. Now to the structure of my doctoral thesis. Um, since the constitutional and procedural questions that are raised in this thesis are linked uh, to the development of technical nature, the technical foundations must also be addressed, even though I'm a lawyer, but I try to do my best here. Um, this interdisciplinary approach is also reflected uh, in the structure of the thesis. Um, from, apart uh, from the introduction, obviously, and the conclusion, the thesis can roughly be divided into two main sections, namely a technical one, chapter one and two, uh, and a legal one, chapter four to six. And these two sections are connected by chapter three, which um, concerns the possible fields of application of AI in court proceedings, so a more use case approach. Um, to get into the first chapter, uh, the technical foundations. It should be again divided into three sub sub uh, the, oh, the, the technical section as a whole should be divided into three chapters. And the first one uh, is called like technical foundations. And I try to roughly outline uh, the concepts uh, uh, that are um, uh, often discussed right now concerning AI as well as legal technology in general. Um, I will then try to um, or, uh, point out that I will follow a comparatively narrow understanding, uh, which is sort of the same as uh, machine learning. And then um, since uh, AI and machine learning um, can be examined in its entirety, I try to um, specific, specify uh, uh, use cases of machine learning um, in court proceedings um, that I would like to focus on. Um, in the second section, a comparison should be made uh, between human and machine decision uh, decision making. 
Um, in doing so, both uh, humans and AI systems uh, are cl uh, classified in terms of machine theory and the main differences uh, between them sh sh shall be illustrated. Um, the current state of AI research, so-called weak AI, and also uh, the comparison of humans and machines against the background of the four forms of intelligence, according to Walster, um, serve as a starting point. It shall be shown that humans and AI systems do have parallels in decision-making at first glance, which are primarily the characteristics of adaptivity and non-triviality. However, if one takes a closer look at the decision-making process, um, it becomes relatively clear that the difference that differences very well exist uh, in the factual. As mentioned, the third chapter serves as sort of a transition uh, from the technical foundations of the thesis to the legal analysis. Um, the focus of this chapter is on certain AI systems potentially used in court proceedings and their technical characteristics um, identified on the basis of civil procedural regulation. The use, uh, the AI use cases and their technical features uh, shall be elaborated on the basis of selected stages of the civil proceedings and the respective tasks that have to be performed by the judge. First, uh, the topic of taking evidence in the context of the oral proceeding oral proceedings is examined in detail as uh, a procedural stage in which the judge interacts with uh, people and objects uh, that are involved in or at least relevant to the proceeding. The question of how the judge has to proceed and uh, which uh, of their skills are particularly called upon uh, depends uh, to a large extent on uh, the type of evidence that is involved since the taking of evidence is uh, characterized by the interplay between evidence topic and evidence types. Following the taking of evidence, the judge must uh, evaluate, evaluate uh, the evidence and then also determine the facts. This stage uh, of the proceeding is uh, sort of an example of a part of the judicial decision-making process that takes place only in the judge's mind and only becomes apparent to the outside world when the judgment is uh, rendered. In the course of evalu evaluating evidence and determining uh, the facts, uh, the judge has to cope with a rather large number of necessary decision-making processes of various kinds, for which, however, the law uh, provides him re or her relatively few points of references. Um, in many cases, there's only a more general refer reference to the principle of free evaluation of evidence. Um, the skills of that um, the skills uh, to be demonstrated by a judge in dealing with this kind of stage of the proceedings are thus uh, less tangible than those necessary for the taking of evidence. In essence, it is a matter of systematizing, evaluating, and interpreting the information gathered in the course of the taking of evidence, and this requires the judge to have some sort of capacity to comprehend human communication, uh, including uh, the understanding of the perceived acoustic, but also visual signals, for example, uh, nonverbal um, communication as uh, shown in the face of witnesses. Um, the third area of judicial activity um, where AI could be used is the field of legal assessment based on uh, the established facts. Again, this is a stage of decision-making that does only take place within the judge's mind. However, the process of a legal assessment requires a, a separate consideration because it's not a logical empirical one, but a rather normative dogmatic task. Um, after a theoretical positioning, uh, the steps the judge has to take in order to arrive uh, at the legal assessment of established facts are to be determined. Um, from this, in turn, the cap capabilities of uh, the judge can be derived, which in the case of recourse to AI applications uh, would also have to be fulfilled uh, by AI. 
Essentially, uh, this involves knowledge and understanding of the entire applicable law, as well as the ability also to interpret the law as a prerequisite for subsuming uh, the established facts. The, de the determination of the potential forms of AI suitable to support or supplement a judge in the course of civil proceeding proceedings is followed by a legal analysis, constitutional law analysis, and the central question is whether and to what extent constitutional norms are affected by the use of such uh, AI technologies. The constitutional implications can essentially be divided into three categories and will therefore also be dealt with in three chapters. The first category comprises the constitutional provisions that um, address the judge as such and also uh, their characteristics. This refers to the constitutional enshrined judicial guarantees, in particular judicial independence and uh, the skills that can be derived from that. Together, they form the concept uh, of the judge of constitutional law. Um, in the search for the core content of this constitutional concept, it is necessary to first answer the question whether the constitution assumes the existence of a judge. Um, if this is the case, which in case of Austria it is, um, the next step is to analyze, analyze um, whether such an assumption can be equi equated um, with the obligation to restrict the function of the judge to a human or whether an AI system could be appointed as a judge. Um, this question, and I want to point that out um, uh, specifically because this is often confused in literature, I feel like, uh, is detached from the question of whether AI meets the constitutional requirements for the judge apart from being a human being. Therefore, the goal of this uh, first subject sub chapter is to find out whether the human being serving as a judge uh, as such has an intrinsic value under the constitutional law. Next, it is now necessary to examine what kind of skills a judge has to have in order uh, to meet um, the constitutional requirements when identifying these skills. The tasks of a judge, when identifying these um, skills, um, the task of a civil judge needs to be fulfilled, and therefore that serves as the starting point or the point of reference. Um, thus, the first step is to examine what skills constitutional law requires the judge to have in the course of taking of evidence and uh, establishing facts. The second uh, step is to ask what requirements the constitution places on the judge as a lawyer, and in addition, the requirements concerning the personality of the judge on the one side and the question of the internal decision making process on the other side needs to be addressed. Finally, based on the requirements um, that have been identified for judges uh, from a constitutional perspective, it must be examined which of these abilities or characteristics could be fulfilled by AI systems, at least to the same extent as it is done by humans. Um, if against the backdrop of the technical state of the art uh, of AI, it is concluded um, that certain features of the constitutional concept can currently only be fulfilled by a human being. Um, appointing an, an, an AI system to become a judge is ruled out. The support of AI systems, uh, which, which is not per se inadmissible as a result, must subsequently then be measured particularly against the standards of uh, judicial independence. And this ultimately re results in a differentiated picture which uh, of the AI applications I tried to identify in chapter three are compatible with the constitutional concept of the church and which are not. Um, the second constitutional category against which the use of AI in the course of civil proceedings is to be measured relates to provisions that are specifically tailored to court proceedings and thus constitute procedural guarantees. In contrast to the previous chapter, um, the perspective is not that of the judge, but of the person subject to the law as uh, a party 
to civil proceedings. As a result, the central constitutional provision is not judicial independence, as is laid down in Article 87 of the Austrian constitution, but rather the right uh, to a fair trial enshrined in Article 6 of the European Charter of Human Rights, which is in Austria constitutional law. Um, the question to be answered in this chapter, uh, the questions are similar in structure to those of the previous one. Therefore, it must first be examined what kind of concept underlies Article 6 uh, uh, ECHR and uh, whether the human nature of the judge as such is mandatory to ensure a fair trial in the sense of the convention. Um, the next step is to consider which of the AI applications identified in Chapter 3 are potentially in conflict with the components of Article 6. Um, in detail, this involves publicity, orality, immediacy, independency, again, and impartiality. Um, a special component in this context context is the question of the infringement of the right to the lawful judge, as this is uh, laid down in Austria, not just in Article 6, but also in Article 83, Paragraph 2 of our federal constitution. And then finally, this chapter will address the issue of access to justice, since uh, the aim of AI and particularly legal technologies is to improve this access to justice, which can be derived also from Article 6. Um, Furthermore, the use of AI in the course of civil proceedings could also be in conflict with constitutional provisions that do not necessarily define court proceedings as a prerequisite for application. This is primarily the principle of equity and uh, the components derived from it, as well as uh, the right to respect the privacy. Um, Related to this is uh, the prohibition of the degrading of the use of human being as a mere means to an end, which can be derived primarily from Article, from article um, 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights and is also very closely connected to the principle of human dignity, as it is laid down in the uh, Article 1 of the uh, Fundamental Rights Charter of the European Union. Um, this complex of issues will be examined as the third category of, of the constitutional analysis, complementing the two uh, other chapters that I just tried to describe. Um, finally, to conclude, obviously a summary um, of the findings will be given. Furthermore, in case I detect any kind of um, gaps, uh, I try to um, make prepositions, de lege verenda, um, if and in what way the constitutional um, framework uh, should be amended. Thank you very much for the attention, and I'm very looking, very much looking forward to your questions and also discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, the first question is, um, you state that humans and AI-based systems show parallels in decision-making, which are primarily the characteristics of uh, adaptivity and known triviality. But you say that there are differences as well in the factual. Can you give an example on this difference and why they are important for the constitutional assessment? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the main limitations and therefore differences right now is in the field of emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Um, uh, these are fields where AI uh, or machine learning is performing very poorly right now. Um, and these are uh, qualities that a judge obviously also has to have in order to uh, assess, uh, for example, a witness and, and uh, tell whether uh, this person is telling the truth or not. Um, machine learning or AI also has a very hard time understanding the big concepts um, as we humans uh, do. Um, 
yeah, and then uh, obviously we, we do learn a bit differently. We do think a bit differently. Um, for example, a human uh, is much more aware of the whole decision-making process from his or her own perspective. Therefore, it can um, try to trick us by giving reasons that were actually not the reasons for deciding, which is something an AI system can't do unless you train it to lie. And then that's like the goal, but it does, it's not aware that it's lying. So um, that's maybe a few few examples to to show that. Thank you so much. And I have a second question, more uh, centered in access to justice. Um, if I'm not wrong, you state in your presentation that AI could help access to justice. Uh, but uh, considering the existence of inequality among different types of litigants, such as big law firms and companies on one hand, and individuals and vulnerable groups and on the other, uh, who tends to have more advantage by the incorporation of AI system to civil proceedings? Uh, in other words, uh, these technologies tend to amplify the inequalities in civil proceedings, do you think? Um, very interesting question. Um, I, I'm honestly not entirely sure. I think it would depend on the kind of technology. Um, of course, uh, especially big law firms with a lot of um, money uh, can afford the greatest technologies and therefore um, uh, become even more powerful. The same holds true for big companies in general, um, regardless of the access of just to justice um, or governments. Um, but I do think that it might also help those that would not have uh, the means normally to go to court when it comes to um, I think, for example, uh, the flight right uh, platform um, that helps you to get your money if your airplane was delayed, for example, something like that, like those small things where like normal people, I want to say, or people that like don't have an, enough money or whatever would never go to court to and that might help them. So I think it really depends on, on the kind of technology that you focus on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, Mihail has a quite statement. Uh, it's it possible to answer all these questions in one thesis? So he states, uh, maybe it would be advisable to narrow down uh, the scope to the issue of formal versus procedural fairness. Evidence-based reason is an enormous topic. I don't know if you want to make some comments on that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I thought you, you met him. Thank you um, for this. Uh, I, um, it is indeed uh, something that is, uh, a, well, I have a lot of uh, questions to answer in this thesis. That is uh, quite clear, I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by formal procedural fairness and evidence-based reasoning. Um, I have to reduce myself from to the dogmatic perspective. So um, I try to only answer these questions um, from the perspective of constitutional law. Um, I don't answer them from a legal theory perspective. I also don't answer them from a psychological perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from a so sociology perspective and all of that. Um, so I really concentrate to, um, just uh, on constitutional law and uh, therefore I think it is manageable. And I also try to maybe give uh, some more general ideas and sort of points where I think we're standing right now um, and then other scholars can focus maybe on a tinier um, bit of that and, and do a more detailed analysis. Um, yeah, so, but I, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly or your concern. So could I have just a small follow-up? Uh, so evidence-based reasoning is the reasoning related to the assessment of evidence and we have a lot of different approaches uh, in AI and law in this connection, starting with uh, classical uh, uh, rule-based or uh, argumentative approach, or story-based uh, uh, approach, Bayesian approaches, uh, and finally the application of machine learning algorithms. 
And each of these systems raised uh, quite different questions in connection with the assessment of evidence. So uh, this is, of course, just a point in the discussion uh, because uh, it, uh, it may be possible uh, to like rightly address uh, all this question within one thesis. Uh, but I think that uh, it uh, raises the threshold of difficulty uh, because uh, you actually need to investigate uh, many different approaches uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the tools that may be used uh, in connection with uh, uh, evidence uh, related part of uh, civil proceedings. Formal uh, or procedural fairness refers to such issues like the equality of parties or uh, formal warranties uh, in the uh, in the course of uh, legal uh, legal procedures, the assessment of the formal part of the lawsuits and other documents, and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, uh, of course, it's uh, up to you and uh, your supervisor to determine the scope of this research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, definitely a valid point. Um, I try to uh, not have this um, danger of addressing too many things. I try to address it by um, picking use cases. So for example, when it comes to evaluating evidence or um, taking evidence, I want to look at a very specific mimic recognition system, for example, um, or an, a, a system that analyzes the speaking. And so I have like, for each section that I just tried to explain, I have like two to three use cases. Um, and then I want to look into them and how they work um, and compare to how the human does it and then see what is what from the constitutional perspective. So I might not like that's that's also why I tried to say um, it would be almost impossible to say I, I look at machine learning in general and see because there are just so many like from a technical perspective so many different options that's why I, I try to pick out use cases and I hope that by doing them I can sort of come to more general conclusions that can be a great starting point to then an analysis do an analysis on other specific technologies that might be used at some stage in the proceeding. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Mikhail and, and Monica also, and all the ICAI organization. And I personally find it very um, interesting, all this first panel. And, well, let's keep in touch and I invite you all to get together in our short break in the, our network space. Get together up to 9.30 GMT. Okay, see you there.
18th International Conference on Artificial Intelligence. My name is Lucas Morimoto, and this is the second panel for the fifth day of the event. Also, in the name of the ICAO organization, I would like to thank our platinum sponsors, Jus Brasil and Albert Einstein, Israeli Hospital, our gold sponsors, Logarithm, Legal Code, and PG Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, Opsiblum Lawyers, and Oasis Open. Now, I would like to introduce Mr. Okechu Efudu, who will present his paper with the title of An African Perspective on Answering the Ethics Question, Who Should Make the Rules on Self-Driving Cars? Mr. Okechu, you have uh, three minutes of speech, and afterwards we'll move on to the questions. The stage is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Lucas. How many minutes do I have? Sorry. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. I thought you said three. Okay, great. Let me share my screen then. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much. It's such an honor and privilege to be a part of this amazing conference. Um, my name is Jacob Kejuku Efodu, and I'm a PhD student at the Osgood Hall Law School at York University in Canada. And so my paper is on an African perspective on answering the ethics question, who should make the rules on self-driving cars? Um, so pretty much the outline of my presentation is going to be very simple. I would look at, um, you know, why an African perspective on self-driving cars is, is important. That would be right after my introduction. And then I would look at... Um, uh, who else should be engaged in the ethical rulemaking on, on self-driving cars? And I use else because there's a lot of literature around um, who is making the rules and, you know, the ethical guidelines around self-driving cars. The fourth part of my presentation would be um, what other ethical constructions should be explored in the rulemaking for self-driving cars? And then finally, I would just, I would just uh, make my conclusion. So starting with the introduction, um, in my paper, I start off with a poem. It's an African poem, which was written more than 25 years ago. It's written by Timothy Wangusa, he's a Ugandan, and he wrote a poem called uh, A Taxi Driver on His Death. Um, it is a fatalist poem that talks about this taxi driver who relies on his car for transportation and for, for work. That's his source of income. But then in the poem, the taxi driver is also quite worried about the fact that he might someday find himself, you know, being killed by this car, being that he's always on the road and um, pretty much his entire life would be on that road. And so he, he sort of predicts what his future would be like. And I use this poem to start my paper because I wanted to reiterate some of the fears that people have. When we see a lot of people write about self-driving cars, they always think about what exactly is this car going to do when it meets a situation where it has to maybe crash into somebody or crash into five or three people. There's always that truly question we see thrown around. And so there's a lot of hypothesis around what will a self-driving car do if it meets such a, situ um, such a situation. Um, but besides, you know, some of these views, why I'm really focused on this work is because I wanted to look at um, this trending conversation about ethical rulemaking for self-driving cars. I wanted to consider two things. Who else should be considered when making the rules? Are there people missing when we're talking about rulemaking for self-driving cars? And also more importantly, I was thinking about what other ethics can apply from an African perspective? Is there anything that um, the African norms around ethics and rules can actually help inform this global infrastructure around self-driving cars? But then I also um, am reminiscent about certain theories, um, one of them, which is the actor network theory that sort of looks at um, that, that, that looks at uh, how to structuration of material world. So for some people, a car is an object of beauty, wealth, and pleasure, but it's also something that can be quite intimidating for some other people, um, especially for someone like a taxi driver, for example, the car is not something of beauty and wealth or pleasure. It's something of a tool, a tool for work, to, you know, a tool for labor. And so when we think about self-driving cars and how artificial intelligence systems will operate within these new vehicles, it would serve different purposes for different people. 
the other thing is to look around the dominant narratives and artificial intelligence, which hasn't really reflected a lot of African perspectives. And so in the literature, they consider the African population as an undersampled majority. And so in all kinds of AI systems being developed and deployed, there is the need to have um, more African representation. So in my work, uh, in my paper, actually, um, the second segment, I ask a question. I said, will these cars save us or kill us? Why an African uh, perspective on ethical rules for self-driving cars is early, but important. So currently, there are no self-driving cars in Africa. So people say, well, why are we talking about the ethical rulemaking for self-driving cars if you don't have any in, in Africa? But there are certain reasons why I'm, I'm making this, uh, this, this, this prescription early. The first is that um, African countries have the highest number of debt from road traffic accidents worldwide. Um, for example, for every person who dies from a car crash in Sweden, the comparison is 27 people in Zimbabwe despite the fact that there are less cars in Zimbabwe, right? And then of course, global road traffic deaths are responsible for claiming about 1.35 million lives in a year. Car crashes are the eighth leading cause of death for humans across all age ranges. So when we look at the current situation of uh, automobile uh, crashes, and we think of how self-driving cars would reduce this amount of deaths, from an African perspective, I want to know if these uh, lopsided imbalances regarding who suffers more is taken into consideration from an African perspective. The second point is most algorithms that are used to develop self-driving cars are, are not trained or they don't represent African data, right? Um, and this is, this is pretty much a given because you don't have like African companies develop self-driving cars, or you don't have companies abroad who develop self-driving cars using African data. Um, and of course, the third point about little or no representation in the involvement of Africans is very clear. And there's hardly any standardization or ethical tests being carried out within the continent. So you see that despite the technology being affect, um, despite the technology affecting Africans maybe disproportionately, there's not much of the development around self-driving cars that takes place within the African continent. But we do know very well, and my, my position is that when the world becomes very vast and accepting of these cars, Africa would not be removed from that. Because of globalization, you would also find that, um, you know, Africans will have to deploy self-driving cars, but will these cars fit into the African roads? Will people in Africa understand or be able to use the cars in the same way they'll use it in Singapore or Canada? These are some of the reasons why I'm making this proposition. And when I use self-driving cars, I'm not, um, I'm not oblivious of the, the constructions, the terminologies within literature. So for example, I always say autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars interchangeably, but um, I know that uh, the Society for Automotive Engineers, SAE International, they say that uh, it's better to use automated driving systems, but I'm using the more social language so that I, ca I can communicate um, quite easily. And I think um, the last point about an African perspective being able to advance technology for all is quite insightful um, because there are a couple of things from uh, African normative culture or from African ethical culture that uh, represent certain values in rulemaking that the entire industry, both in the West and here, would definitely benefit from. And I think that's what also one of the reasons why I think this African perspective is very, very much um, important. Um, according to the 2020 Autonomous Vehicles Index, um, I think the five most prepared countries for self-driving cars are Netherlands, Norway, the United States, um, and I think Finland and Singapore, of course. Um, but out of the top 30 countries, there are no African countries that are ready to deploy self-driving cars. However, there is conversation within South Africa, Kenya, and some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa that are currently speaking about um, what self-driving cars will look like when they get to the African continent. So the, the point here is any science at all that uh, wants to solve a problem without taking people's lived experiences into account may end up furthering 
hegemonic influences and could even produce dangerous or life-threatening outcomes. And I think this is something that we want to prevent. Um, the last point I'll make before I move to the next slide is um, when it comes to artificial intelligence systems, especially around rulemaking and ethical guidelines, we've seen that there is a unique space for African contributions. For example, African feminists have criticized the ethical standards that uh, rely on objectivity as an ethical principle, uh, ethical principle of AI. They have proven that such ethical prescription is pretty much a myth and would amount to erasure. So even this concept of data feminism that we talk about today arose out of the need to provide a new way of thinking about ethics, an ethics for AI that is governed by ideas of intersectional feminism, pretty much to challenge the differentials of power that arise from AI systems and other technologies. So again, the focus of my paper is to reflect on two of these specific issues. One is to explore who else should be engaged in ethical rulemaking for autonomous vehicles and uh, where responsibility should also be located. And then two, um, from an African perspective, what other kinds of ethical constructions can be explored in the ethical rulemaking for self-driving cars? So the next part of my paper, the, the third part of my paper looks at who else should be engaged in the ethical rulemaking on uh, self-driving cars. And when I say who else, of course, there are people who are stakeholders in the industry from the manufacturers to the computer scientists, to the ethicists, to you know, government personnel, like lawyers like myself. Um, but I also say in my paper that the government's role in ethical rulemaking for self-driving cards has to um, extend beyond you know, prohibitive or regulatory actions. I believe that from a generativity lens, from the theory of generativity, it's important to think about how um, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary can engage um, in very unique ways, right? Because there is a participatory aspect that regulators can bring to the table, not necessarily just as watchdogs, but, you know, in my paper, I say they can act as gardeners or as midwives to ensure that this growing technology, that as the technology is growing, they're able to sort of learn and adapt or adopt to certain uh, uh, ethical ideals that could help the technology grow in terms of preserving the lives of people and protecting the technology to benefit human systems and, you know, and humanity generally. But I also talk about something um, which is, is called co-regulation, right? Um, so pretty much there, there is a traditional form of a top-down regulation, which is like legislation. And it, it, this legisla legislation and top-down approaches when it comes to regulating AI hinges on the threat of um, physical or pecuniary sanctions. So there's that one, but there's also the bottom-up approach, which is an assorted way of self-regulation. And it comes with um, legal constructions and limited accountability. But then when I talk about co-regulation, I'm, I'm recognizing a middle-out interface between top-down and bottom-up solutions between legislators and stakeholders. So this middle interface is something that uh, the EU data protection regulation, the GDPR, offers as an alternative model for legal governance. Uh, I think in Article 5, subsection 2. Um, so I'm looking at that premise. However, in my paper, I describe something or I prescribe something called a baobab tree approach. And I, I do this in three prongs, which I would explain very clearly. But for people who don't know what a baobab tree is, um, a baobab tree is like, it's an African tree, it's very big. It's, um, you find it a lot in Zambia and Zimbabwe. They have huge numbers there. Um, I employ the imagery of the baobab tree here, not just because of its uh, symbolism within Africa or its economic significance, but also I want to use it as a visual imagery of having the roots of the tree, which is facing the sky um, as popularly considered. So the imagery here is just to epitomize the visible and open analogy for a foundation compared to the roots, the popular ideal, um, which is mostly stuck to the ground sometimes. So I'm sort of flipping the switch here to think of a new creative way to think about um, where do we locate regulation and how do we, how do we construct the meeting points for um, ethical rules around self-driving cars. So this barbab approach that I propose comes in three ways. And the first proposition I make is 
When thinking about who else should be engaged in the ethical rulemaking for self-driving cars, I believe firstly that whoever that can be held liable or responsible for any damage caused by a self-driving car, whether directly or indirectly, such a person should be involved in the decision-making process around ethics. So if it's the uh, autonomous vehicle manufacturer or the producers of a particular motor part or the road designers or even somebody who does like the aesthetic finishing of the car, basically any key player really, um, the person who programs the code, all of these individuals need to be a part of the decision-making process on ethical prescriptions too. Um, this is because any engagement around law and ethics, it's important that we can foster learning from both fields, from both computer science, from both law and ethics, but more so um, is to ensure that um, no one is a less significant player because every person can provide relevant insight through consultation or engagement. And um, again, from an African perspective, people who are like taxi drivers or bus conductors or traffic wardens, um, cyclists, pedestrians, hawkers, really, these people might be insignificant from a Western perspective. They're like, well, who cares about the hawkers or the conductors? Maybe you don't even have that in your country, but in a place like Lagos or Lome or Lusaka, um, it's important to see these people as stakeholders who are going to be using the roads as well, except they will not be using the same roads that these autonomous vehicles will be using. Um, so yes, that's the first one. Anyone who uh, plays a role in the development process or in the deployment process should play a role in the ethical process as well. The second approach that I make within my Baobab construction is that um, the ultimate decision about what ethical prescriptions get programmed into autonomous vehicles, this should not be made by a single person or a single company um, or a single country or a single industry, right? So due to the vast number of populations and professions that are affected and will be affected by autonomous vehicles, I think that there is a strong need for multi-stakeholder engagement on the various kinds of ethical prescriptions that, could, that can be programmed into rules-based autonomous vehicles. So a rule that applies in like say Singapore and Canada might not apply in Ghana or Nigeria. So you don't wanna have uh, one industry or a cluster of countries within the West deciding for all of the world around how these rules around um, ethical prescriptions for self-driving cars should be. Um, and so, when we talk about the knowledge production or the mobilization of ethics and AI, which is still emerging, right? It's still emerging. So there's need for a lot of collaborative partnerships. It, it, there's a need for establishing multi-level engagement, not only at the level of the um, UN, for example, or the EU, for example, but also the African Union. And for people who are familiar with the West African states, also the, uh, the economic community of West African states as well. Um, so I, my second approach for the Baobab uh, lens is to see that there is an alliance that involves government, industry experts, international organizations, private sector, civil society, academia, and um, even local participants like road traffic unions, you know, taxi drivers and whatnot. Um, and then the third point, the third prong of my Baobab approach is premised on the fact that, you know, Self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles are still a budding invention. They're still nascent, they're still growing. So to figure out how to build these ethical autonomous, how to build ethical guidelines in autonomous machines is still a challenge, right? So no matter how lofty the ideas are on ethics, no matter how many values that we are able to program into an autonomous system, it is still the machine itself that would comply with the rules and laws, um, perhaps unilaterally engage in this difficult calculation, whether to ram itself into a wall or to crash into a human being in the face of a predicament. So I propose something called um, experimental ethics, experimental ethics, which could provide valuable insight into the social, cultural, and even legitimate moral standards that are not only expected, but practical. So as we're developing this technology, let's practicalize around some experimental ethics. What ethics can be encoded by design into some of these autonomous vehicles that would not need, um, that would sort of come up automatic within the structure of how the system is actually built, how the algorithms and the AI systems are actually built. 
And then I move to the fourth part of my paper where I talk about what other ethical constructions should be explored in the rulemaking for self-driving cars. And um, I don't want to restate what is already existing, but I could run through some of the current ethical prescriptions that people have given. For example, in the field of public health ethics, people say that autonomous vehicles must since autonomous vehicles would impact on traffic, population, and even the public environment, that it's, in, it's important for the ethical guidelines to think about a public health perspective to ensure that the way that the algorithms are designed, they must think about like the safety of the people, the mobility, the legality, how these AI systems in these cars can decide quickly with complete information to ensure that people's health you know, is protected. There is also ethical rulemaking within computer science and engineering, and these ones rely on the theories of liability. In law, we say, okay, who bears the brunt when it comes to, is, is, is there going to be strict liability? Is there going to be negligence? Will there be a breach of implied warranty of marchantability? These are questions that we speak about when it comes to the unethical, when there's unethical manufacturing you know, and whatnot. There is also social ethics, which looks at the concept of expected risk, expected value, blame assignment, um, and also things around social pressure, which is very important. There is also the philosophical ethical considerations around um, um, autonomous vehicles. Again, if you've been following the literature on autonomous vehicles, there's been a huge obsession with the trolley problem, the trolley problem. And so um, people have said, well, even though you say that a self-driving car should choose to save the life of a little girl over a grandmother, it might seem moral, like, okay, you're protecting the life of a young one over the older one, but it's still unethical because that car will be discriminating on the grounds of age, right? And so there is need to think about design cost functions and to calculate the expected cost of crash optimization, optimizing the very lowest cost. And of course, there's always ethics in law, which is my field, uh, in, you know, in terms of uh, the justice framework around self-driving cars. Um, but beyond that, in my paper, I say that, yes, ethics around self-driving cars should be governable, responsible, equitable, discernible, and reliable, but ethics is not enough. And that's my proposition. My strong proposition is that we need to do a lot more than ethics. The reason is because we've seen situations where people are trying to comply to ethical standards, but they fall into ethics washing or ethics shopping. Um, we need to create laws and rules that people can stand by and stick to. It is more stronger to rely on laws than to rely on the goodwill of the industry. And um, so when I say we need to rely on laws, my position is to focus on international human rights law. And I propose that as, as the international, as the law, legal framework that self-driving cars should rely on as a minimum core. Um, in April this year, the European Commission released its proposal for an AI legal framework, the AI uh, Act, which is which is brilliant. Um, in terms of the rules, it emphasizes things like transparency, um, the fact that AI systems must be designed in ways that a human oversight is guaranteed while it's in use, which is great. So when we talk about accuracy and robustness and cybersecurity around these AI systems, um, one of the reasons why I say, let us draw inspiration from international human rights norms and standards as a minimum core is because um, where legal, where there are no legal structures or where legal proceedings fail to address some of the issues that will come from these cars, we can actually rely on international standards, right? And we already have international standards that, um, that already give foundation for the governance in three ways. Um, one is that it will provide a common language to frame harm and offer clear parameters for what is permissible. Number two is we have we already have certain principles around like accessibility or affordability um, within a human rights framework, which I think works. And number three is about the fact that we can use human rights impact assessment, not just for accountability purposes, but where harm has been done, there's an effective remedy that people and groups can access when it comes to relying on the human rights framework compared to just an ethical guidelines. So those are the reasons why I, I situate um, that. Mr. With... Okay, Chukwu, you have five minutes left. Perfect. And I'm going to round up with my last five minutes. 
Um, in conclusion, the point I make is that um, it's important to look at self-driving cars with the need to investigate and challenge the differentials of power that this innovation may bring. For example, ethical rulemaking on autonomous vehicles needs to be open. They need to be continuous. Um, they need to be inclusive and collaborative. They also need to be communitarian. These are what I consider Africanist values. For example, in Africa, we have a humanist mantra. We say Ubuntu, the Ubuntu principle. I think Ubuntu is Zulu. It's from a Zulu uh, proverb that says, Ubuntu, Ngubuntu, Nabantu. I don't know if I murdered that, but it actually means that I, I am because you are. And so therefore, um, the Western obsession with intellectual property ownership around codes, AI codes, for example, needs to be reimagined, right? An African perspective thinks of a communal and a communitarian um, approach to some of these values. And the second point is um, the self-driving car industry needs to reflect on the ways that autonomous vehicles may disproportionately endanger Africans. Because based on our colonial past, based on our historical past, technologies have not really favored African populations as they have favored other people. Um, and so the various ways that uh, these cars may perpetuate systemic racism or algorithmic bias, um, it's important that they reflect on some of these and ensure that um, the innovation is brought closer to home than just deploying them with capitalist gains. On a last different note, final, final note, I would say that whilst we're still developing the technology, is it possible to think of cities that will be vehicle free where pedestrians will not have to worry about being hit by a car, be it a self-driving car or otherwise? And because Africans die more than others from car crashes, is it possible that we can harness the same technological capacity of the fourth industrial revolution to produce cars that don't actually kill. You know, perhaps let's think of manufacturing cars with impact resistant, lightweight structural materials that are unable to cause bodily harm. And so um, these are some of the propositions that I make in my paper. And uh, I'm grateful to be able to present in this, in this conference, seeing that there's not, again, there's not much representation of people like myself or people with my kind of views here. So I'm happy for the opportunity to engage and I look forward to hearing the other great presentations and answering any questions that might follow. Thank you very much. Mr. Oketu, we have, uh, we are very thankful uh, for your presentation. Uh, and we have some questions regarding your presentation either. Uh, the first question is from Professor Michael Araskiewicz, and it is, uh, Professor, would you like to do the question yourself or I can read the question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, I would have a question concerning the methodology and the ethical theory you are going to consider. Because uh, numerous uh, contentions that you have made are similar to those expressed uh, by John Rawls in the theory of justice, uh, like the theory of reflective equilibrium, taking into account the interests and preferences of uh, all the stakeholders who are uh, taking decisions uh, um, from behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, but this is only one of the possibilities and I am actually curious about your choices in this matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mikhail. Um, I think Rawls, John Rawls' theory, if I remember very well, revolves around the adaptation of like two fundamental principles of justice, which sort of tries to produce a just and a moral society. So the first principle guarantees the right of each person to have their most extensive basic liberty compatible with the liberty of others, right? And so when we talk about international human rights law, it's not just about everyone having a right, but also having a corresponding duty that um, attaches to that right. So again, one of the proposals that I make from an African perspective is looking at the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which recognizes that every right comes with a corresponding duty. And so when we deploy self-driving cars within Africa, for example, or across the world, there is a responsibility for the 
manufacturing companies a responsibility for them to respect human rights. This is not just a proposal or just like an ethical guide. This is actually international law because by the UN, there's a UN guiding principle on business and human rights that proposes that businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights, right? Of course, the state has a responsibility to protect people's lives, but businesses also have a responsibility to respect those rights. So determining what rights in question and how they can go about respecting that right is where the detail comes to play. But of course, I agree that this has some affinity to the Rosian ethics or the Rosian theory of reflective equilibrium. So yes, I agree on that, you know, um, on that point. Thank you, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Okechuku. We have another question by Thomas Tsurik, and he says, a uh, very interesting proposal, especially because it raises some important ethical issues. However, I wonder from the point of view of research methodology, how are you going to prove your thesis? Okay, great. So in terms of methodology, um, I don't know if the question is about the methodology around my paper or the methodology of an African perspective when it comes to rulemaking for self-driving cars, but I could touch on both. Um, so pretty much, there is no the methodology the frame within which i'm looking at my work is i have a hypothesis a prediction that self-driving cars in africa is not a if question it's a when question right it's like thinking about questions people have had in the past will there be internet in africa will in, will african states um go to space for example there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh, pessimism around the, the the kinds of things African states can do or not do, but we live in a global construct. We live in the age of the fourth industrial revolution where technology affects everyone everywhere, every time, right? Spaces are deterritorialized, right? The only thing just connecting us here is not really the boundaries of the spaces that we, you know, that we live in. So if self-driving cars are going to become a thing in the world, they definitely will become a thing in Africa. Um, however, I also say that African states, and I put this in my paper, African states who do not want to deploy or use self-driving cars should be able to have that option as well, especially because of the past of how technology has not been able to favor Africans in so many ways. Um, so that's one. On the methodology in terms of thinking of how we can prescribe this ethical or rulemaking guidelines, this is exactly the crux of my work. And I'm saying that we need to get as many more people in the room to be able to make this happen. And so when I talk about my baobab tree approach, it's multi-pronged, it's very extensive. It must ensure that it gets the views of literally anyone that has anything to do with this technology. Um, being people who are having like key roles to play, like the software designers, the people who are coding, the computer scientists, the manufacturers, up to the consumers at the very bottom of the chain, such as the drivers themselves or the unions that sort of govern the activities of these drivers, or even people like you and I, the ethicists or you know the, the sociologists who can think about some of these things, right? Um, it is difficult, again, to get all of these people when I talk about a global town hall in my paper, um, but it's important for consultation to be made at various levels, especially because this technology is growing really fast um, and it's going to be most people are going to think of it in an autonomous way. So it's going to have like autonomy to do and not do certain things on our roads. And so when I talk about the biobab tree approach, I understand it, it, it might be difficult to get all these key players into the same space, but it's important to get their views and to get their consultation here. And where that is not possible, like I mentioned, we might want to think about experimental ethics. What ethical guidelines have governed technology in the past? What worked and what didn't work? As we see new laws come through, like the GDPR or the AU Act, for example, or in Brazil, where you have your own version of the GDPR, we want to not see African states just copy them or say, okay, well, you already have the law. We want to see them be holistic. Let's have a much more global or regional perspective around these ethical guidelines. And I think that would be a great way to go with it. Okay, then thank you so much, Mr. Ketchuku, for your presentation and for your, the answering of your questions. Now, uh, I would like to introduce Mrs. Kerry Hyde, who will present his uh, paper with the title of Judged by Machines, How Do Algorithms Now Use in Criminal Justice Impact on the Legitimacy of the System? Uh, so, Ms. Uh, Hyde, you have 30 minutes of speech, and afterwards we'll move on to the questions. Thank you. The stage is yours. Sorry. 
I've lost my uh, <laughs> my 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 my, camp, my um my microphone. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is uh, a real privilege to be able to take part. Um, I, uh, my, I want to present my, my, my project titled Judged by Machines. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm working from King's College London uh, in the law school. And my um, topic is how do algorithms now used in criminal justice making uh, impact on the legitimacy of the system. So the, my research takes part, like takes place in a, a, a an environment which I think of as a policy environment, though it's you know it, it's uh, more general than that, no doubt. But um, we have justice system with uh, resource issues um, and um, massive backlogs in terms of cases being heard, criminal cases in the UK now can take something like two years from uh, their first hearing to actually a trial. So, uh, you know, that, that has massive impact on justice. Um, we're also very aware of now human fallibility. Um, side, you know, from obviously you have discussions around the area of bias. Um, we know that there's that humans employ things like hur heuristics and um, we know that logical fallacies are used in you know courtroom arguments um, which can cause problems in terms of justice in themselves uh, to try and adjust these sort of things we, um, we it would be remiss not to look at things like decision tree algorithms machine learning algorithms bayesian reasoning and to see how one can improve the situation. And I think it's in an, a sort of environment of urgency as well. Um, so my research so far, I've, I've conducted a, a pilot study just between uh, 2019 to 2020, where I, I, I conducted a number of inter interviews and I, um, I observed um, a kind of um, construction of a concept um, in a hackathon, a kind of decision-making tool. Um, and uh, my decision support recommender systems conference and um, the Turing Institute in London. Uh, but my, my work was basically, I was trying to take this sort of um, heterogeneous approach, looking at various viewpoints. Um, I spoke to members of the, the senior judiciary and also computer science, um, uh, justice campaigners, etc. So I was trying to get this holistic root view um, on which a base to build my my research um, going forward, so that so that whatever I wherever I took this, it would be practical and relevant to whomever you know well, the, the whole community in a sense. And that's that's the objective. It's it's a broad one, but it, that's what I'm aiming for. Um, and that's just a word cloud, fairly basic one of the uh, uh, of the kind of things that came out of those interviews. Um, I think there's a serious resistance to change within the um, legal community, and they have been, you know, Richard Suskins refers them, or rather says you can either be a jealous guard of your situation, you know, and, and not and protect your self-interest and have a, a fear of, you know, what, what may happen, um, or you could you know, you're a benevolent kind of custodian, you're, you're trying to help, you're trying, you've got genuine concerns. And the trouble is, how do you, you know, unpick what's going on there? Um, and, uh, and what happens, or I feel is going to happen or must happen is a kind of forced change that might come through, you know, some policy development or otherwise. And, and I think it's so important that this is done properly. Um, in terms of uh, you know what? What my literature that I'm looking at and how I'm trying to build this is, you know, that what I, I see is a number of internal kind of approaches, um, and that's not a criticism. It's a strength in the sense that they, they need to have internal um, uh, sort of validity. So you have, you know, legal academics and professionals talking within their um, sphere of legal doctrine. Is it legal to do to have AI in this circumstance? Can we legislate against it, or can, how do we limit it? You've got policymakers who have completely potentially different uh, perspectives. They see the need for justice to be, you know, sort of seen to be done as well, and um, 
not that that's not a concern of the other scenarios, but it's just a um, it, it's it's a different dis discussion that's going on there. And then obviously in the expertise in computing decision making, uh, you know, sort of psych 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 um, psychology and in computing, where we're looking at the kind of the mechanics of it. How does it work? Um, so that's a challenge to try and um, bridge these things. And that's what I'm trying to attempting to do. Um, my concern with the sort of current approach um, is there's there's a lack of unified success criteria. You you know, you uh, say, you know, what we're talking about in legal ethics or something like that is very different to what is being talked about in other spheres. So, um, you know, in, in you might have a proxy for something um, like transparency or legitimacy in a, it, when you're trying to assess an algorithm, which is very different to how that term is considered in, you know, um, in a in the different internal sphere. Like I'm saying, you know, the, the sort of legal sphere, and th this is a this is a trouble. And, and I think it's something that's been recognised in, you know, in in the conference so far. Um, you know, I watched Steg in et al's. Um, uh, a paper on on um, talking about how we ensure rationales um, uh, are you know it's not just good enough to be sort of uh, ac accuracy is the the, the thing and I, I, and when I'm talking about I mean I I think efficiency is a very important thing but we need to know what the output per cost of the resources employed is what are we aiming to achieve with our justice system we can't be sure that we've adequately got guilt down you know that we don't know if our justice system at present is is adequately uh, identifying guilt so learning of those those old um that old data is, is is a challenge and um there's also this idea of risk you know and we talk we had talks this week about you know the um uh, the AI, uh, the, the European um, perspective on what is high risk and things like that. But I think that we have to have a way of, of assessing this risk beyond the level of the individual. How do we assess and weigh that? And my argument is the crucial thing is legitimacy here. Um, uh, this is just very briefly, I've highlighted some um, ways in which my work overlaps with what's been discussed this week um and uh you know we, we, we're talking there's a lot of talk about obviously ethical use of ai um and the need for the lawyer's perspective to be taken into account um and we know the internal debates on, on philosophy but i i think you know we need to pull apart the mechanics of the decision making process in a judicial sense where is morality there because we're not you know it's supposed to all be rule based and and if we can't pull it apart and understand where it is um that's you know that th then you know we, well we have to be able to identify it. it must be there somewhere so let's let's find it um but i think generally we're left with a sort of unsatisfactory lack of answers um and i'm saying i'm proposing the legitimacy answers that and just to say uh, you know the explainable ai this i know this is all going through a lot of these uh, discussions that are going on and i'm not going through all the uh, literature here because i, I just want to get to what my proposal is um so the way i i perceive legitimacy is actually an empirical definition um, it comes from uh, Tyler, who's looked into how people um, perceive legitimacy and how um, that impacts on their behavior. So we have, um, if we look at the very bottom box there, the effectiveness of government and success of policies, this is important for all of us. Yeah? So this is a, a common goal um, because we want you know, um, some kind of stability, yeah? Well, our humans, uh, it's been shown in empirical research that the voluntary cooperation with the authorities and adherence to the rules of behavior is so crucial for sort of, you know, social coherence, et cetera, is based to a stri striking degree on the quality of the treatment that they receive and the quality of decision-making that they perceive in the justice system itself. And, and the, I think crucially, this metric's not limited to um, algorithms or AI. This is a metric that can be used for the current justice. In fact, that's what is traditionally been used for, and it can be now applied to the um, you know the sphere of 
of, of algorithms coming into the justice system. And what I try to propose here is a kind of uh, systematic way in which we can take into account humans' perception of, of how these tools may work, how they, you know, uh, uh, as well as their, you know, sort of effectiveness um, in a way that is sort of makes all our goals, you know, together. They, it doesn't matter which of those three columns or whether you're in the computer science or the uh, legal ethics or whatever, that we can work towards the same thing. Um, and um, yes, and exactly, it works with the idea of we've, we've got failures in engagement at the moment, you know, and, and it's just so crucial that we, that we find a, a way forward. So my proposal is a, a systematic approach and my method, which I will go through shortly, is I, I, I propose is, is rigorous. I'm trying to make it rigorous. I'd be so happy if you could tell me a way to make it more rigorous. And, um, and uh, it's a hybrid of social science techniques and, you know, um, well, I'm proposing kind of Bayesian legal idioms uh, way of, of dealing with it. Um, the measure I've already gone into legitimacy and um, that can be that will be measured using Likert scales, a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of that a measure. And uh, we're looking at testing it with the public and elite stakeholders. So hopefully this is something I could then could be replicated, could be extended. To narrow the field, I'm choosing two specific um, uh, two specific case cases. Okay, one is an, a, a civil affordability calculator, very basic decision tree algorithm, which um, will look at, uh, you know, ha have you, how much do you earn? How much is your expenditure? Can you afford to pay this fine? Okay, now this is something traditionally done manually. It's in the uh, online courts pilot in the UK. It's been um, put into an algorithm, very basic, should be relatively un innocuous. And then a traffic offence, which I've chosen as being another basic a uh, relatively basic offence, but a bit more complex. And with that offence, there's no existing algorithm, but I want to build a model using advanced qualitative techniques and this concept of, of legal idioms. Once I've created the stimuli, which I can then expose people to, I want to test those, those processes through online testing. So using a recognized behavioral science program platform, which tests people's responses to very thing, various things, I will, I've been testing, you know, trying out ways of getting things on there that I can then measure people's reactions. And I will follow that with quali qualitative interviews and, and focus groups. So the single justice procedure, which is the, the basic traffic offense uh, that I'm looking at, it's a relatively, it's a very simple process at the moment. It's, it's uh, the most it's sort of straightforward, it's dealt with one magistrate and it goes from a letter um, saying you've been accused of this um, offence. It goes through to um, if nobody responds, then you find more or less automatically guilty. Um, there is the potential for a magistrate to intervene, um, but I think in practice, at least, uh, it seems that that's rare. And this was something, obviously, I will develop through the case study, you know, the, the rarity of this ele element. And then if one um, says you're guilty, you may, or, or you're guilty with mitigation, but you don't request a hearing, it's done all on the papers. Um, and it's only if one says not guilty, then it goes to a hearing. Um, so it's, I think it's interesting, it's, it's worth looking into. The other one I've already explained is just a very basic decision tree algorithm. And I see these two case studies as overlapping, that they can expose through their overlapping elements and their sort of differences, um, a, a rich kind of a landscape of how these, imp uh, how legitimacy can be impacted um with various types so what i'm really trying to do is say like how can we unpick in policy terms um you know well not just in policy terms but generally how can we unpick is it right or is it right is a bit of a term but you know is it profitable is it the right thing to do in sense of effectiveness of the justice system for for you to introduce um, an, a particular type of algorithm. And I'm trying to unpick different types of algorithms in that sense. So um, so just want to explain as well my data collection process. Um, the two case study approach 
um, the first stage of that is a kind of building stage. We, I, I, I'm going to use my doctrinal analysis, which the basic kind of legal analysis of the offence, um, to an, analyze this basic traffic offence, which is a signage uh, in failure to, to adhere to a sign, traffic sign. I'm also going to try and observe a short period of observation in, in, in um, magistrate's court. That's only brief because I have experience in magistrate court, so I don't need to observe that much, but just to ground it in some reality. Um, and then I will be interviewing court staff, legal advisors. This is the purpose of this first stage is not to try and gather qualitative data. It is to create a model. Yeah? So that's the, that's the, the first stage. Um, and then the second, so I'll, I'll then, you know, I'm backing and I'm then developing that with colleagues in, in um, computer science. Um, the second case is the affordability calculator. That's much more straightforward. And I will, once I've developed the um, stimulus, you know, that I want to expose people to on, online, then I will put those two onto Gorilla, uh, the platform, the behavioral science platform, and, you know, follow that up with once i've harvested the data um, from the responses the clicked responses that we get there also follow that up with focus groups and uh, semi-structured interviews now i'm really interested in any comments on everything but this especially when i've gone into advanced qualitative social science methods um, I know I've seen that there's there's cause they're, they're very interested in causal relationships, of course, and the kind of diagrams and interrelationships that I feel that they're creating in those kinds of uh, analyses are, I think, analogous to the the same process that we see or the you know, reasoning that we see in Bayesian methods and Bayesian uh, things like the legal idioms that Fenton and Neil, for example, um, have um, you know, set out. So I've asked you, I've had a go. Um, this is this is Fenton and Neil's example. I've had a go at doing one on the basis of doctrinal analysis alone. But the point is, is I'm going to use the interviews, use social science methods to create, to, to then take all this information, this, 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 this sort of structure, this causal structure, and place it into, uh, you know, sort of then translate it into this sort of legal idioms kind of um, thing. And that's going to be a process I'll go over in the building stage. Then back to my data collection set process, I move on to the testing. And the testing stage, um, I'm looking at um, quantitative data, um, I've already covered this, but identifying different responses, etc. And I see it as a starting point for further research. This is something that I could expand. And I'm looking at trying to, conf to um, communicate with the policymakers and, well, the, the whole community very much, you know, um, Jake, I think you know it was very very interesting um, uh, discussion about the need for various viewpoints, and I absolutely agree. And there's no voice that should be ignored in that sense. And I think this is a way of potentially showing people how we could do that, yeah? how we can make sure that voices are heard. Um, this is an empirical measure that I'm trying to do. It's not one perspective. Terms like trust, rule of law, respect, they have different meanings in different, from different um, viewpoints. But this legitimacy this definition is empirically measurable. It's something we've got a, you know, a scale. Uh, we know that that links to people's adherence to the rule of, or to um, law and their cooperation, which are absolutely foundational to how our legal system works. So I, I see it as, um, you know, a, a, a very interesting and an important way of dealing with it. Um, and yeah, I just said my last point there is just linking it to previous discussions I've heard this week. The last thing I want to discuss, and it's it, it's just, uh, I feel I want to just explain this um, complex building analogy, which um, I think is a way of understanding why the approach that I suggest I see as as, as important and, and crucial. It's I don't think it's an arduous thing, and I'm arguing this to my colleagues in social science in law. I don't think it's an arduous thing to go from this descriptive 
let's see what everybody is doing at the moment kind of situation and 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 to to go from that to the bayesian causal um relationships i think it's natural and necessary i think in using you know we're not just describing we're creating a model and i think those two things are intrinsically linked the complex building analogy comes from goande and his it's in the the um checklist manifesto where he discusses how important it is just like jake says actually that we're looking at everyone in that environment contributing to what's happening because um if you think about a situation where you've got a team and he describes describes a, a team of um uh he describes a team in a surgery, a surgical, because he's a medic, he's, he's in medicine. And he says, how important is that the nurse or the person handing the scalpel or whatever, that they are heard and they have a place in that discussion. Um, and it's integral to the actual success of the whole um, exercise. Yeah. So, so it's not a nice to have let's have a nice ethical thing where we have nice people, you know, it's just, no, it's integral to the success of the ultimate objective. And I think this is the crucial thing. He, he Gawande also talks about the, the, the rely, making reliable management of complexity a routine. And we have an incredibly complex scenario here. The, the justice system has many experts. You have to integrate with experts from other, other fields. Uh, computer science fields and things like that and when we think about construction and construction of large buildings we used to have this idea of the master builder who would just they would design it they'd be the architect they would then create you know they'd oversee the actual thing if someone wants to put a pipe in there he'll check that it's okay because it would have been a heed most of the time um and he would, you know, sort of, or want to put some electric electrics there, he would check that that's structurally right, or we want to knock a wall through there, he would check. That's not how construction is done right now. Um, what we have is, um, you know, various schematics, various things where we're trying to integrate um, different expertise, no different one, no one expertise is overseeing. And I see legitimacy as this structural integrity of the justice system. The main thing is we don't want the building to fall down. This is our unified goal. And by using this um, rigor, I hope rig rigorous way of looking at it, we can, um, we can make this management of complexity a routine. We can make saying, right, we're going to introduce an algorithm now to help to help this judge make the decision, it won't be. May, maybe it will totally replace it. Maybe it won't. Maybe it, it's um, administrative only. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's substantive. We need a way of answering how we interpret those, you know, sort of interventions. And it can't be one person. We have to have a structure and a method. And I think, well, I'm going to try and and see if this is a method that will work. And in the process, even if it doesn't work. There's a massive, you know, I, I'm exploring, I'm exploring how, um, you know, the, these kinds of algorithms can help. I'm exploring how these different um, stakeholders can contribute, what they experience in it. Um, and I'm exploring how the public in sort of um, focus groups responds to uh, algorithms being involved in justice in various scenarios. Um, Yes, it's a it's a high risk possibility. That's what I, I think it's it, there is, a, you know, we're, we're talking about high risk um, elements of, in, in AI. And I think this could be high risk. You know, of course, it can be just as anything, you know, oh, let's just uh, in, a, in a building knock down that wall. It might be easy and it might and it might be improving or it might be a bearing wall and cause serious issues. There's no way we can know that holistically without this. Inter in, interaction of people at every stage and every level and the method I describe is trying to see if this is something we could say right this is how we test this is how we ensure and it should be an ongoing process I think it, it facilitates um Ms. Hyde more, and, excuse yeah, me you have finishing. five minutes left <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I'm more or less finishing and I, I'm I'm uh, but I have other slides I can discuss, but I just thought uh, I'll keep it relatively um, short because I'm so interested in contributions and um, feedback from everybody. But um, yes, yeah, so if, we, if we can, uh, I'm hoping 
that this exploration actually facilitates. It doesn't, you know, it, I'm not trying to close any doors and say there's no um, uh, need for AI here or here's a line we shall not cross. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody can say that because um, that's often from one perspective. Yeah. So I think we need, we say, well, we can't cross that line because we're um, in a situation where, um, you know, where, where it's, it, it's just um, the, the, the payoff is not enough. But let's look at what's happening right now in terms of justice. It's just not happening. We're not getting justice. Uh, lots of people are not getting justice. So uh, if we talk about bias, we've got the counter argument. As if you say bias in, in algorithms, there's bias in human um, uh, reasoning. And when you have that interaction between um, two people, you know, sort of this situation where, well, we need a human overseeing it, or it's okay if we have a human um, check that what the algorithm says is true. Well, there's, there's so many issues with that that I'm not going to go into right now. But the, the, the point is, who decides when that overruling is right or not right? Again, we need a structure for this kinds of kind of of, of uh, discussion, and and the discussion the, the structure is what I propose, uh, and hopefully it will be an interesting journey. Okay, so I think that's um, all for me for now, <laughs> and I'm so yeah, I'd be really grateful. I just I also wanted to thank the reviewers who looked at my paper. I'm so grateful because I so want to communicate in this field and um, I'm yeah, very grateful for pointers and how to be bet a better communicator in this, in, in, in this situation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Hyde. Uh, the first question that we have is from Professor Mikal itself. Uh, and Professor Mikal sent in the chat and is in connection with one of the previous talks, I'm interested in your opinion on the relevance of constitutional constraints that may have bearing on the application of your results. Mm. Okay, so there's there's a reason that I don't look into uh, constitutional law um, in great depth in this, and it's not because I'm not interested in constitutional law. I'm, I've, I've done a lot of work in constitutional law, um, but in the UK, um, we don't have a written constitution. Uh, we have political, um, a political scenario where it's actually um, obviously possible to introduce whatever, basically, if the particular political will is there, then I don't see constitutional rules preventing the introduction of any of algorithms in any scenario, really. I mean, it might sound extreme, but it's from experience in the British legal system, things are flexible um you know and therefore I, I think it's an important it's not that i'm ignoring that side it's an inter but it is still an internal legal discussion so it's 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 crucial in the sense of what is right and is this you know and there'll be a lot of arguments there that will contribute to um you know to that structural integrity idea you know and it's not that i'm trying to uh, in any way undermine that not at all I see all of these views as in incredibly important, but I, when I'm looking at what I'm trying to measure here and how I'm going to take the process forward, uh, I didn't think it was wise to restrain myself by constitutional law, you know, sort of saying, well, this is not going to happen because the constitutional law will not allow it. Because in Britain, we don't have that written constitution. We don't have a limit in that sense. So that if, if, if political will was that, you know, we want to fully automate this particular process. Yes, there'd be, there'd be very big objections from many sides, but legally it could still happen. So that's why it's sort of more of a contributing rather than an underlying foundational thing. Okay, our, our second question is from Andre Eller, and it is, on your abstract, you affirm that there are serious questions regarding the legitimacy of human-only judicial decision-making. Could you explain it a little? Of course, yeah. So um, I think we, we, there's, there have been studies that have shown, um, I think it's the Danzinger, um, apologies if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, um, study that shows that, you know, or at least purports to show that there's a uh, variation in how judges will make certain decisions 
based on uh, their, you know, whether they've had lunch, whether they've eaten um, uh, recently. And uh, that, I mean, that is a, a measurable effect. It does occur in terms of um, reduction of the ability to, uh, sorry, it, it's a sort of lack of glucose equals uh, resist, um, what's the word? sort of reticence in making particular risky decisions. Yeah, so it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a measured effect. Whether it's, it's as extreme as it's shown in that particular um, study uh, is questionable, or it has been questioned. But that, that aside, so you have, you know, do judges make decisions like this, you know, um, arbitrarily based on that? that that's clear. We, we, that's a clear query and an important one. Um, we have uh, situations where uh, prosecutions, etc., are based on evidence that doesn't necessarily add up. So you have, like, you know, the, the situation where, say, some uh, the prosecution is arguing. Uh, so these three things add to the the guilt of this person, or the likely fact, likely idea that this person has committed this offence. Yeah, uh, he works really nearby. He was seen, you know, walking around there, um, and he lives within fifty yards. Those two, those three things, they don't, they don't add to each other. They, they're, you know, sort of, they're all because he lives nearby. It's it's more likely that he's you know going to be in the area because either, and, and I think the trouble is is that there's a lack of rigor sometimes in in, in judicial decision making and jury decision making etc. Um, which which is getting louder and louder. This this problem is getting it is it was a time where we weren't looking into this and and in fact using um, you know the fact that we can do things like predict court uh, you know um, predict uh, outcomes of court cases and things like that that's not going to give us well I don't feel that's not going to give us necessarily justice but the point is it exposes sometimes uh, problems that were not exposed before so we have a situation where like you know we know well why is it that 79 percent of the cases you know um, are based on on the facts and what about the other 21 percent of the cases then you know and this is um, coming from the uh, Letra et al um, study but you know it's these sort of things which expose potential for people to say well actually what are, what are the judges doing that they, they they don't actually know um how to do it and and you obviously have biases as well which we we're, we're well aware of so i think that um there's a strong argument to say it's actually wrong not to use the machines you know it's wrong not to get them involved and not to use the things that are, are there to help us to address these biases these heuristics that we're using that are improper at times and ensure that we're actually getting real justice so um that's where i was coming from on that one okay so thank you so much miss hyde for your presentation it was very clarifying and now uh we are going to move on and I would like to introduce Mr. Kartik Chabla, uh, who will present his paper on, with the title of Transactions on Privacy and the Tools that Assist in Inter Interdisciplinary Analysis. Uh, Mr. Chabla, you have 30 minutes of speech and 30 minutes also uh, in, inside of this 30 minutes, the time for questions either. And afterwards, we're going to move on to other questions. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucas. Um... My name is Karthik Chabla. I'm a PhD student here at the Department of Management uh, and Information Management at Dilburg University. Um, and I have a background in law and law and economics. Um, and it's it's an honor to be here and, to, and uh, to be here for the feedback, for all of the amazing discussions. Um, the topic of my thesis is transactions on privacy and the tools that assist users in such transactions. And we take an interdisciplinary perspective to this issue um, because we believe that um, it's important to consider this from the perspective of, uh, of not just law or technology, but both, and take into account the market forces, the uh, business circumstances as well. Um, so, yeah, users, individual users such as uh, you and I, we contract on privacy on a regular basis. We interact with standardized digital contracts such as terms and conditions uh, every time we visit a website, every time we download an application and, and agree to its terms. Um, but these are, uh, and, and these contracts often include terms about how they handle personal data, um, what impact they have on our privacy. 
Um, and these transactions should be governed by the uh, terms and conditions. Uh, in the, so the user in such a transaction um, explicitly or implicitly provides personal data to the service provider or provides payment in exchange for receiving a particular service from the service provider. And this should ideally be governed by the terms and conditions of the transaction. Um, however, these terms and conditions and this whole uh, nego the, the process that results in the creation of these terms and conditions and the uh, process that is that is carried out after the, we agree to these terms and conditions is not necessarily efficient. It is not necessary. It does not necessarily enable private ordering. Um, and we will come to the problems that users face in this in the next slide. Um, um, but, and the methodology that we use to address uh, this problem is uh, the design science problem, the uh, design science methodology, the first step of which is problem identification. So in the first chapter of my thesis, we uh, I look uh, so before coming to the problems actually. So to understand the interaction of users and service providers in the context of the terms and conditions, we use the uh, lens of the contractual life cycle to organize this process. Um, we draw this flowchart on the basis of uh, Governor et al's paper, uh, depicting the various stages that users go through in interacting with the terms and conditions um, and with the contract. And then we further categorize this into three phases. The first one is the negotiation and formation phase where the users are interacting with the service provider and setting the terms of the interaction. This is also where the modification stage would come in and this is where the storage and notarizing uh, if necessary of a contract should happen. The second phase is where the users interact with each other and the real world to ensure that the terms of the contract are actually being put into effect, they're actually being performed. And in this phase, both the parties also uh, monitor each other, should ideally monitor each other for compliance with the terms. Um, we also add a uh, technical enforcement stage here, which is an exception, and we will come back to that in a later, stage, in a later slide. Um, and finally, we have the dispute resolution uh, and, and, and termination phase where users also, and the service providers may interact with each other uh, in order to resolve a dispute, or they may interact with third parties such as arbitrators, uh, regulatory authorities, or the courts, or where they may simply terminate the interaction. Now, um, in the first chapter of the thesis, we conducted uh, an, a descriptive literature review of uh, legal literature on the problems users face in these interactions. Um, and this, this is uh, an early stage results, but there are clearly quite a lot of problems that users face. And these problems are not necessarily limited to transaction costs. Uh, they're not necessarily limited to uh, a particular subset, but they, for instance, users also face behavioral problems in inter interacting with these policies. Um, but one of the most uh, common and underlying problems across the first two stages at the very least is opportunistic behavior, where uh, it, the user has to be careful about the service provider acting opportunistically. Um, and it, the in, a, in the literature, a lot of focus is usually on the notice and consent, the negotiation and formation parts of the problem. But as we will argue later, the other uh, parts of the problems are also crucially important. Now, a lot of these problems cannot uh, can be addressed with privacy enhancing tools, which are the focus of our analysis, analysis but some of them still can't. And so for instance, in dispute resolution, and if you actually want to take a, a privacy claim to court, um, one of the bigger problems tends to be establishing privacy harms. And that's not an issue that PETs, uh, I would argue, can currently uh, assist users with. Um, so to set the stage for our analysis, we limit ourselves to uh, a total of five stakeholders. The first two we discussed were the user and the service provider. The third is the legislature, which may create legislation that provide default rules for the terms and conditions, or they provide a prescription for the transaction and the, and the entity's behavior in that itself. They may also create a regulatory authority that enforces these default rules or provides guidelines for their implementations. And crucially, we also look at developers of privacy enhancing tools. And these developers may come from the legislature or uh, sorry, they may come from academia, from the industry, from regulatory authorities. Um, and they create privacy enhancing tools to help users with this transaction. The tools may also be created by the service provider itself and they may or may not interact with the terms and conditions themselves. Um, this, con this, this uh, scenario is a little bit context dependent because the same uh, entity that is a service provider in one interaction may very well become the, uh, a third party in a, se in a second interaction. Uh, so for instance, if you're uh, interacting with uh, and, and, and 
if you're interacting with Apple directly on an iOS device, Apple is the service provider. However, if you're interacting with Instagram through Apple, then Apple becomes a third part, uh, a service provider inter in intermediating your interaction with a third party service provider. Um, and we do not focus too much on uh, these third parties currently. And for today's discussion, we focus on the privacy enhancing tools and their developers. Now, as we saw, the, the users face a lot of problems across the life cycle of the contract, across each of the three phases. And uh, as we will uh, elaborate on a little bit, uh, these problems are interlinked. So our working hypothesis is that uh, an end-to-end -end contractual or transactional uh, privacy enhancing tool should be able to assist users in each of the phases of the contractual life cycle with the problems that are relevant to that part of the life cycle. Um, and it should be. It should help users uh, as a, it's a support tool. And why is such a tool needed? Um, we aim with this tool to give users a sort of bottom-up uh, empowerment. Um, and this, we base this on the idea that a contract changes incentives. It it in, it forces a, a party to uh, act differently when it because it is enforceable and it is enforced. Um, in the second chapter of my thesis, we cover, uh, we can conduct an uh, overview of uh, existing tools, existing legal interventions and existing uh, privacy enhancing tools in order to find out what the coverage and the gaps in this life cycle are. But that is the generic level of the analysis and we instantiate this analysis into a narrower scope, into the scope of uh, cookies and cookie policies uh, and cookie concern managers to, and to uh, make it a little bit more practical. Um, and as Schwab et al. note, privacy policies are often written for the purposes of compliance, but the actual uh, negotiation of, of defaults, the act, what, what Mirel Hildebrand calls the negotiation of defaults in the on-life era, but, uh, where users actually select which, private, which uh, options apply to them, that happens in the context of cookies through cookie consent managers. Um, now, the, to for specify this context, we have Jane Doe, a user who wants to access a website called Proton News. Um, she wants to access some of the content that is on that website, and in accessing this content, she's also given, uh, she's also becomes an audience through certain ads that Proton News is displaying as part of its own revenue model. Um, Jane Doe provides, um, potentially provides some payment and maybe even provides some personal data as part of this transaction. Um, the terms and conditions may not explicitly state that this is, that the personal data is provided in exchange for that uh, service, but yeah, they may just state that this data will be collected if you use our services and these are the options that are available to you. So the cookie policy is what sets this apart, but cookie concern managers are what give users the options to interact with this. Um, in our context, Jane Doe is a resident of, uh, resident of Amsterdam, and therefore uh, the EU and the Dutch Parliament together create regulations such as the GDPR uh, and its local uh, implementation, the AVG, uh, and the e-privacy directive, uh, and the Dutch Civil Code, which, inter which affects this transaction. Um, we, we also have the authority persona Hekevens, which enforces these default rules and also provides guidelines for this interaction. Um, but our focus today is on this side of the transaction, uh, of the context, where you have where you have developers uh, providing privacy enhancing tools that assist Jane Doe in this transaction, and where you have Proton News providing its own con uh, cookie concern management platform. Um, so just the model that I mentioned earlier, the broader model of um, problems users face in interacting with the, uh, with the transaction on privacy across its life cycle, we apply the same mod, uh, the as much of that model here as it fits into the context, and we further conduct some analysis to identify particular problems unique to this context. Um, and and to put it into the same scenario, when Jane Doe first arrives on the website uh, on the Proton News website, she faces the uh, cookie concern manager, the banner that comes up in front of her, and she at that point has to take the steps, uh, the negotiation and mod uh, and formation steps. She has to go through the uh, options available to her. She has to make uh, effective choices, identify the parties, the third parties. And this is where she faces ex ante negotiation costs uh, relating to the complexity of the uh, documentation, the complexity of the, the, uh, of the information, even in the cookie banner, the potential for dark patterns. Um, and also crucially, whatever consent she gives, it's, uh, it's usually hard for her to be actually able to store that consent locally. Um, and this, even if she crosses all of these problems, even if she deals with all of these problems and makes effective choices about her consent, she then enters the second stage where both the parties are performing their parts, their parts of the contract and where they are uh, monitoring each other for compliance. 
and this is where she faces the second problem because even if she uh, makes the effective choices there is she has very little by way of uh, an option to ensure that those choices are actually being followed and this is a problem not just for jane doe but for reg regulatory uh, authorities as well now if you see on the right side there is uh, some research uh, some recent research that has been conducted on problems users face with cookies um and at the bottom the, uh, a lot of these problems focus on the negotiation and formation stage but uh, in in matter at all uh, their study they analyzed 508 websites and they found that 5.3% of those websites did not respect the choice of the users even after the users actually put in consent uh, denied consent um and then finally let's say that jane doe makes the effective choices that she uh, finds out that her uh, choices are not being followed the third problem that she faces is how does she actually complain about this how does she actually um file a file a case if she can how does she um, uh, enforce that part of her transact of her uh, rights contractually agreed upon terms um and so for addressing this we come to the second uh, part of the uh, design science methodology which is an analysis of existing uh, solutions so we conduct a state of the art uh, st uh, study of the technical interventions that are available we conduct this in a broader form in chapter 2 but for this uh, for right now we have a purpose of selection of cookie consent management and tools that assist users with cookie consent management um and we do this in order to avoid the green field policy we want to see what tools are available what tools uh, what existing tools can do and how we can build on top of that or how we can contribute to that now the first tool that uh, comes up in our analysis is the cookie concern manager provided by the service provider itself and i'm not going to go in detail here uh, on that um but perhaps no discussion of cookie uh, of of privacy enhancing tools and especially cookie related privacy enhancing tools is complete without discussing the platform for privacy preferences which was one of the earliest uh, privacy assistants to exist um and which was quite uh, quite an interesting idea and it was quite well implemented also but it failed to find adoption in the market it failed to uh, and even when it was adopted there were significant problems with uh, service providers acting opportunistically um, use abusing the notation and miscommunicating uh, their privacy practices um another uh, protocol that tried to do something similar was the do not track protocol um and that also faced significant adoption issues um especially if you read privacy policies nowadays you would find that at least somewhere they some of them tend to have a clause that says we do not respect the dnt signal if you were giving if you're sending that out um but one interesting tool in this uh, stage is and one more recent tool is a tool called consent omatic um and this is based on research conducted by mit and what they did was they analyzed the cookie concern managers uh, used by multiple websites i think they analyzed over 600 websites for this um and they created a rule set based on that and what the purpose is that you see on the left hand side you can automatically select uh, you can pre select which of these you would like to allow across websites and then every time you visit a new website it automatically communicates your preferences through the the cookie concern manager given on the website itself so these this does two things different from the previous two tools the first is that it relies on the gdpr and uh, and and on the structures created by the gdpr and the second is that it incorporates a principle they call adversarial interoperability in order to ensure that their tool does not face the same adoption issues um but again this tool can help jane do in communicating that she does not want to give consent to any of these purposes but it does not actually help her monitor whether this consent is being respected or not which is where we come to the second tool cookie classes um which is based on the research conducted by matter et al um and it is a scaled down version of a of a different tool that they developed for testing cookie consents but this is also a, both of these consentomatic and cookie glasses are google chrome plug are uh, web browser plugins um and this essentially decodes the consent string stored by the cookie uh, the consent management platform to help you see what consent has actually been stored and so that you can cons uh, ideally compare it to the consent you wanted to give um and we also in this context in the context of monitoring for compliance 
It's also important to mention privacy seals, such as Europrise website privacy certification, which are not PETs, but they can uh, act as signals from the service provider to the user of uh, compliance um, within their own limitations. But the third tool that we discuss uh, is, the, is the EFF's privacy badger. Now, one of the things that this does differently from the other two tools is that uh, this is not necessarily what we call contractual tools. It does not necessarily deal with the terms and conditions given in the transaction itself, especially in its third set of functionalities. Um, but what this tool does do is that it enables a technical enforcement of the user's privacy preferences. It is based on the web browser and because it acts uh, as an intermediary between the user and the service provider's actual functionality, it can um, help the user implement their privacy preferences at the browser level. Um, in, and in a way, insofar as it does not interact with the contract itself, it's a signal of the user's privacy preferences. Um, and to put it differently, uh, we call these signaling tools, tools that do not interact with the terms directly, but signal user preferences. So for instance, if you use an ad blocker and you end up on a website where they, do, um, they ask you that, please, uh, we rely on this for, uh, we rely on ads for our revenue. So can you please disable your ad blocker? That's a mini negotiation that take pl takes place right there. Um, and finally, the dispute resolution, to be honest, uh, dispute resolution is where the least amount of tools uh, were found in this analysis, but we did find this um, cookie compliant the cookie complaints tool for uh, released by the UK's uh, Information Commissioner's Office, which allows users to submit uh, complaints about uh, su submit concerns about websites uh, which are using cookies or similar technologies. Now, one important thing to note here is that the, con the consent automatic based its rule set on an analysis of CMPs and on the GDPR. Um, and this is similar, except this relies on the IAB's uh, transparency and consent framework. And they both have similar, uh, they both rely on the GDPR, they both have similar roots, but as you can see, some of the purposes that they talk about are slightly different. Um, and that brings us to the issues faced by third party privacy enhancing tools. The first set of issues they face are interoperability and adoption. This is what we saw with P3P, with uh, DNT, and with Consentomatic. Um, in insofar as that um, they, a, the tool A needs to be adopted by the users themselves, but a lot of PETs don't end up being adopted. Uh, in conversations, in informal conversations with the experts in the field, they note that uh, these tools always come up uh, for some time. They're interesting ideas, but they don't last very long. Um, but on the other hand, these tools also need to be adopted by or be interoperable with the systems of the service providers. Otherwise, the, the, the communication of user preferences doesn't take place, just like with privacy badger. Um, but the other part of this is also that each tool, in selecting its scope, in selecting the term purposes it deals with, in selecting the definitions it allows, um, defines privacy in its own way. Um, or rather, the privacy it enhances as a privacy enhancing tool. Um, and the, uh, the next issue is that while there are tools like Privacy Badger that help users enforce their privacy preferences, their scope is limited to the data that they have architectural access to, that they have, uh, that they can actually control. And in doing so, um, this leads us to the third problem, which is that um, in order to protect your data, they need access to all the data that you need to protect. So they it, they actually have a higher risk of opportunism uh, at that level or, or rather a higher possibility of harm from that level. Um, but in their, and to be fair to these tools, rather than monitoring a hundred uh, service providers for opportunism, these tools allow you to monitor only one service provider. Um, I'm going to go through the rest uh, quickly. Um, because I'm running short on time, but so based on this analysis, we can we created this sort of framework uh, for the next steps for us, um, and these are the steps that we personally went through in the selection of the design uh, requirements for an end-to-end consent management PET. Um, the first step was the selection of a clause. Rather than dealing with the whole privacy policy, we decided to deal with the smallest subset of cookie uh, of, the, of cookies of terms relating to cookies. There are other PETs that don't do so. For instance, Polisys is an excellent tool uh, that, which uses machine learning, but it works on the entire privacy policy. The second selection that we may, we make and we other see other PETs making is the selection of a legal or in some cases non-legal framework to assist 
in their uh, function. So for cookie glasses, this is the consent. Uh, so the IAB and transparency. Uh, IAB is a transparency and consent framework uh, for consentomatic. This is GDPR. The third is the deployment context, uh, where browsers, Android phones, IoT devices, uh, and our survey of PETs, we find that there are a variety of contexts that they are deployed in. Um, and they make and and each of these scope selections have an impact on the functionality that they can enable, um, and also on the knowledge representation and reasoning model that should and is necessarily it's a prerequisite to be able to enable any of these functionalities. And finally, we would argue that you need uh, that a, such a tool need needs three sets of functionalities that deal with each of these uh, three sets of interrelated problems. Now, uh, I have a set of requirements for the tool, which I'm go uh, going to go over for now. But um, so we have not addressed the costs of deploying PETs in our limitations. We have not uh, addressed who should actually be uh, bearing the cost of implementing these PETs. We have not as of yet uh, dealt with uh, hybrid interventions. Um, so PETs plus legal support for them. Um, and we have not yet uh, gone into the realm of the, the actual knowledge representation required to coordinate such a PET across the three levels. Um, we would like in the further steps to design um, a proof of concept PET, but before that we would also like to um, validate the problems we have identified via uh, qualitative interviews and the solutions we have uh, proposed. Um, we would also like to, when do we do have a tool, we would like to uh, conduct expert validation for the same. Um, and ideally, we would also like to conduct an FSQCA based user experiment to test the tool for perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. Um, and we select FSQCA for this because it allows for a configurational analysis uh, and, and to see which combination of functionalities do users appreciate. Um, we would uh, like to do this in, uh, to have the users in, uh, have a control with a regular privacy policy or, a, or one of the other tools from our analysis. Um, and in, and um, we would also like to consider generalizing the framework uh, that we've come up with to uh, consider it as a framework for further analysis of uh, privacy enhancing tools and how they fit into the contractual life cycle. Um, and thank you for your time. As again, once again, it's my absolute honor to be here. Um, these are some early results from my uh, research. And um, if you have any questions, please do let me know and please feel free to reach out on my email at any point. Thank you so much, Mr. Kartik Chabla. Uh, we have one question from the audience and it's from Andre. And the question is, I was thinking by reading your paper, always about parties who signed into a contract and needed to renegotiate its clauses to adapt the documents according to their needs. But then you suggested that governments could implement T T TPTs. Could you explain a little further on the advantages of government imposing TPTs? I'm sorry, I couldn't catch that clearly. Sorry. Um, can you uh, can you put can you repeat the question? Yes, uh, I can repeat the question. Uh, the question is from Andre, and he says that I was thinking by reading your paper always about parties who signed the contract needing to renegotiate its clauses to adapt the documents according to their needs. But then yeah. you suggested that governments could impl implement TPTs. Could you explain yeah. a little further the advantages of governments imposing TPTs? No, um, I would not recommend. Uh, so TP, uh, privacy enhancing tools can be uh, implemented by various parties. Um, and there's a cost benefit analysis that goes into that. There's an excellent paper by Hanukkah Luth about the cost benefit analysis of, uh, of, behavior, of consumer prediction interventions and who should bear the cost, the government or another entity. But for example, uh, recently the EU government proposed a plan for uh, a digital EU wallet, which acts as an uh, identity authentication system and lets users mediate their data uh, interactions with other third parties. Um, so essentially when you use a third party tool like that, it changes this context because then Jane Doe is interacting with the wallet and then that wallet is interacting with the third party. And, um, and whether that so if a government is implementing such a tool the benefit there would be that the government uh, can actually enforce require the compliance with those tools um, but there is no reason to uh, say that other parties could also not implement similar tools they would compete in the market they would be adopt and there would be benefits and drawbacks for adoption on various sides um, but yes it, i don't see uh, why it should only be the government that uh, that implements such a tool other parties could also do so 
Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Chabla, for your presentation once again. And now we, we will have a break and then we will return uh, at 11.30 GMT. And until there, we would like to invite you all to join us in the Getter Town. Getter Town is a platform which the users can chat by using avatars, play some games, and do network in an interactive system. We wait you there. Thank you so much.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 18th International Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Law. My name is Tobias Klein, and this is the third panel of the fifth day of the event. On behalf of the University of Sao Paulo and the ICAO organization, I would like to thank our platinum sponsors, Jus Brazil and Albert Einstein Israeli Hospital, our gold sponsors, Logarithm, Legal Code, and PG Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, Opsiblum Lawyers, and Oasis Open. Now, I would like to introduce Ms. Muna Yuhan, who will present the full paper, Algorithms Deserving Justice, Risk Assessment, to, assessment Tools in Pre-Trial Process. Uh, Ms. Yunan, uh, you have 20 minutes of speech, then we will move on to the questions. So thank you very much. Good luck. The stage is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, oop, uh, uh, can everyone see my uh, screen? Yeah, I think I'm assuming that's, yeah. Okay, so um, my, hello everyone, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Mina Ilhan. I'm a second year PhD student at the Law Faculty of University of Côte d'Azur, based in East France. And my thesis is entitled Algorithm Deserving Justice. And I'm going to talk about risk assessment tools and pretrial process today. Uh, before going into that, just I just want to uh, talk about a bit of my uh, about my thesis. And uh, so my main premise is that algorithmic decision making is causing a paradigm shift in the norms of the criminal justice system. And I believe that a meaningful analysis of technical systems and law calls for a sustained work across disciplines. And I uh, go on to three elements. And uh, I talk about presumption of innocence, individual sentencing, and evidential requirements. But today, I'm just going to talk about um, presumption of innocence. So just for um, as a way of introductory, uh, what are risk assessment tools? And to go into that, uh, we need to understand that risk is actually an old concept in law. And it's mainly used in insurance, thought, and contract law. And uh, these tools, they predict the probability of future riskiness and dangerousness and reoffending, which we call as recidivism. And again, predicting recidivism dates back to the 20th century. So it's not something that has happened uh, in recent. And these tools vary in their scope, design and method of calculating and appraising risk. Uh, the way I see risk assessment tools uh, is kind of in a four circle kind of way. So I'm gonna talk about bail then a bit of conception of criminal justice. And obviously we need to talk about technology and specialities and also the concepts of risk and dangerousness. And uh, following that, um, in, in order to situate it, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the criminal justice system in the periphery countries, obviously. Um, so uh, risk informed decisions uh, did not appear with the prominence of artificial intelligence. Uh, its proliferation begun with the transformation of the criminal justice system in its quest of uh, efficiency, efficiency and efficacy. And in the 20th century, under the influence of legal positivists, um, espoused individual justice with a focus on rehabilitative treatment. But uh, towards the end of the 20th century, um, we saw out of mass incarceration, followed the incapacitation theory, and we saw that it became the principal paradigm. Philly and Simon introduced this uh, concept of new penology uh, to, to denote the new punishment based on probabilities and risk. And under this new system, which is an, a type of an actual justice, have recrafted individuals and social phenomena as risk subjects, moving away from enlightenment notions of individual justice. Uh, due to time constraints in here, I'm just going to say that um, that uh, like quantifying and this actual justice uh, um, goes way back. And uh, quantification became incorporated into narrative form to know, assess, and judge legal subjects. Thus, what happened was an individual is dataized and uh, fragmenting his, her, or their identity into different variables to denote different level of risks. And um, then how did this quantification actually reflect on criminal justice? So the actuarial risk management uh, morphed into uh, the dominant um, discourse sailing away from individual reformation. And we can see this in Jurek. So this is a capital punishment case and it was affirmed based on future dangerousness. 
In this case, the jury was requested to consider whether there's a probability that the defendant would commit criminal acts of violence that would constitute a continuing threat to society. And the court said that a prediction of future criminal conduct is an essential element in many of the decisions rendered throughout our criminal justice system. And even though it is, of course, not easy to predict future behavior, the fact that such a determination is difficult, however, does not mean that it cannot be made. And there's another case, it's Bell and Wolfish. It's a constitutional challenge to the conditions of uh, confinement in a detention center. And here the court held that uh, pre-child detention, ensuring a defendant's appearance in court is a legitimate, is a legitimate regulatory fun function. So this case is important because um, the court betrayed the principle of presumption of innocence by defining its scope only as a doctrine that allocates the burden of proof in criminal trials that has no application to a determination of the rights of a pretrial detainee during confinement before his trial has even begun. Uh, likewise, in Shaw and Martin, uh, the court stated that there is nothing inherently unattainable about prediction of future criminal conduct. And it, it said that it's not, it is possible to predict future behavior. Um, so to, to sum up this section, uh, these cases paved the way of impairing guilt and designating riskiness to pretrial detainees. It sets the stage for expanding, expanding pretrial detention based on other factors by holding that pretrial detention is not punishment if related to a legitimate governmental objective. It gave blessings to limiting the rights of the accused by predicting dangerousness or riskiness without determination of guilt, even when there's no risk of flight. And Goal and his colleagues said that a court allow virtually any type of risks of mission. So we're now com coming kind of back to rats again. I'm, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna do that a couple of times. So why do we actually use rats? So it's been said that um, it reduces cost, it's efficient, it's a major, it has a major role in the bail reform movement in the US. It's said to be neutral. It safeguards against arbitrariness. It combats against human bias and mass incarceration. And because it's believed to give consistent sentences. And um, so again, it's very connected to pretrial, obviously. And the uh, pretrial is an actually very ancient institution. It actually uh, has its roots in Anglo-Saxon history and actually unites all the common law systems. And in essence, um, there lies a clash between uh, due process rights and public safety. And a lot of human rights instruments say that pretrial detention should be an exception and it should never be used as a form of punishment because um, we do not live in a suspect society and uh, we do not believe in creating criminals out of individuals. And to briefly talk about bail, it is a cash or bond property. Um, so it's a security given by the accused that he will appear before the court at a later date. And it's actually a fundamental right. And now again, coming back to rats. Um, how do rats work? So uh, they're basically uh, statistical models that compares and measures individual characteristic against the historic data. They're made up of static and dynamic factors. And then there's a checklist, checklist of risk factors and data to statistically correlate with risk, which includes non-appearance or commission of new crime. Then the output that the algorithm gives is a risk score. Then these scores are turned into a generalized risk category. So there's a spectrum where it's like low, moderate, or high. Then these are read in tandem with decision-making framework or matrix. And just to remind again, these tools are not uniform. Oppa. Um, I don't think I have much time, I'm assuming. So I'm gonna kind of, uh, so just to, just to say, static factors, they do not change, they're historical factors. And dynamic factors, um, um, they require interviews all the time because they're like, they're, they're pertain to mental health. And just to note that so most of the risk variables, they are based on socioeconomic factors, which in the last analysis kind of actually uh, punishes class or punishes poverty, for instance. And uh, just again to note that um, correlations of these tools are not causations. Rats solely turn correlative insights into casual scoring mechanisms, and they're not designate, they're not, sorry, designed to address causations. I can't, why can't I do that? 
So uh, as a way of example, these are the different types of um, risk assessment tools, and these are the different types of factors that are taken into account. As you can see, um, it's not uniform. And to briefly talk about COMPASS, um, which is a very widely used risk assessment tool in the US, it's proprietary, it's based on dynamic interviews, and there's around 107 questions, and it measures flight risk and recidivism risk. So it, it, it includes like family, education, mental health. And this is an example of a, of a questionnaire page. So it asks you whether you use drugs or not, or whether, whether you live alone or not. And I'm gonna come back to this when I'm talking about the case law. So I'm skipping this as well. And there's another way why to use one and the public safety assessment, it's public. So we know how it works and it's based on static factors and it measures three, uh, three outcomes. So flight risk, new criminal activity and new violent criminal activity. And um, again, I'm timekeeping, I'm so sorry. I I'll try to address the questions around it if there are any questions. So these are the nine in input features that are fed. So as you can see, uh, like four features for failure to appear outcome, and then for there are seven features in one and the five features in the other. And then these are read in tandem with the release condition matrix. And uh, one, th one important thing about these risk matrix is that the, this, this matrix is the one that recommends action. So whether you're gonna be released or whether you're gonna be released uh, pertaining certain conditions, uh, because um, it's the least matrix that is, that is used to manage risk. The PCA risk score is just used to measure risk. So recommendations are not decided by the algorithm, but by policymakers. And uh, in here, just uh, again, uh, uh, as a word of reminder, I suppose that utilizing rats emanates the possibility of engaging in future criminal conduct to shape the fate of an accused in the criminal process. And uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to note that like in California, judges use rats to support setting bail, but they often regard the tools when they recommend release. And I think this is kind of used uh, due to the fact that judges are known to be risk averse. So coming to our um, case law. So we have the most important one is Loomis, uh, which was um, uh, which a guy was sentenced to six years in prison sentence due to the Compass risk assessment tool. And um, the sentencing judge uh, told Loomis in this particular case that in all of the different types of recidivism measured, he scored very highly. And um, so he had a very high risk to reoffend. Then Loomis challenged his sentence on due process grounds, arguing that the judge's use of the Compass score violated his constitutional right to a fair trial. And the Supreme Court uh, in the end held that the trial court's use of Compass in sentencing Loomis did not violate his due process rights. And even though the algorithm is proprietary and the way the assessment was made was not disclosed to the court, because Compass did not appear to be the sole basis for the trial judge's sentence. There's another case law and it's Rosen State. In here, the Court of Appeals considered uh, another risk assessment tool application in sentencing. And the court said that uh, it's an abuse of discretion to rely on scoring models to determine a sentence. And it actually undercuts the trial court's responsibility to craft an appropriate individualized sentence. In Malanchik, uh, the Supreme Court referenced Rhodes and, uh, and uh, did not agree with it. And it held that the results of such testing, like the, the, the scoring algorithms, can enhance a trial judge's individual evaluation, and that they actually trust uh, the discretion and discernment of trial judges to give the tools proper consideration and appropriate weight. And in Young Love, again, uh, it was a constant appeal challenging Compass. And the Supreme Court uh, again said that um, it, it does not pose any threat to due process rights. So as we can see, we have very different views on rights, whether it's a good practice or not. But one thing is kind of clear is that like, despite the statements of courts, except in Rosen Everett is a Canadian case that I did not talk about, uh, Barabas and his colleagues um, argue that risk assessments have evolved from a tool used solely for prediction to one that is diagnostic at its core rather than aiding sentencing decisions. So in here, there almost seems to be a consensus that uh, these tools are not used conclusively in the decision-making, 
that it is not a vital component of sentencing. And uh, so there's kind of a denial about the true impact and utilization of rats, because if a tool has no impact of, on sentencing, then why are we using it to begin with? And before going into the sketch of my issues and uh, to my kind of findings slash uh, preponderings, uh, just to remind us that the underlying problems in these tools are not limited to the scene of algorithms. So most of the issues and problems we face are already present in our criminal justice systems. And also, we must read these tools within the following structure. The existing legal uh, and re regulatory frameworks and norms that we have are designed for human decision makers. <coughs> so, um, um, Holmes says that um, the life of law has not been logic, it has been experience. And uh, as of now, we can say that uh, the experience we have with rats kind of points out to calculating justice on people. Uh, however, uh, tracing the experience of the criminal justice system with regards to these tools has been really challenging as there's no uniform application, there's insufficient amount of case law, and there's another issue is the differing results of mainly computer scientists uh, and the findings that they have found when analyzing the same tool. And I think as jurists for us, it is very difficult for us to determine the veracity of these technological tools. But we can kind of say that there's indeed a disruption as uh, the Loomis case kind of points out, a trade secret uh, has been given privilege in a criminal trial and the right to fair trial is at crisis. So we can definitely say that. And um, we can also kind of uh, admit that law is political and the techniques are never neutral. So from gathering data to logging the data to coding and in the last analysis, algorithmic decision makings ultimately are based on assumptions. For example, the quality of the training data or the um, actual modeling relations employed as such, it does not matter how complicated the algorithm may be. It will always represent uh, one specific vision of the system being modeled. Kopp and Robinson state that in the long term, these tools risk giving an imprimatur of scientific objectivity to ill-defined concepts of dangerousness. It may entrench the Supreme Court's historically recent blessing of preventive detention for dangerousness and could pave the way for an increase in preventive detention. And the paradigm shift that I'm referring to, that, that I'm trying to purport, is an exploration and a statement at the same time. It's a statement as technology shapes our practices and beliefs. As Verbeek puts, uh, he says that technology mediates human relationships with reality and it shapes the way in which humans relate to the world and the relationship between humans. Uh, the fact literature's emphasis on, for instance, humanizing AM, for me, partly seems to stem from the mind as computer metaphors. This concept is explicated by Giger and Zerang Goldstein with the tool to theories heuristic. And it is the notion that uh, partially theories emerge from the tools that are utilized. For example, they provide an example of a um, mechanical clock and they argue that how its invention has rendered the physiological processes in mechanical terms. So they observed that the usage of statistical analysis tools perceive the human mind within the following frame of reference. The tools become a theory of mind. Similarly, in the 1960s, in the quest of building a machine that works like a human mind, a computational theory of mind was purported, which, lift, which led to the cognitive scientists to depict human mind as mimicking computational processes. And the exploration side of it, so from the statement comes the exploration side of it. So as we know, norms can be open or closed. And the legal norms are closed, whereas technological norms are open. And the peculiarity of these tools in criminal law is the interplay between the worldwide acceptance of the technical norms and the endeavor to legally reign technology. And the failure to administer the reins creates a permissionless space feeding into the popular discourse of technological determinism. And uh, it, the space uh, kind of reflects the reflexes of capitalism and privileges the potential for benefit over the risk of harm threatening to derail more democratic approaches. So as we said, technology does indeed shape the discourses and belief, but albeit not autonomously. Technological determinism is a political and normative choice as well as a stance that technological companies take. 
This relates back to the paradigm shift in the way determinism offers the inevitable discourse. Rats are a natural extension of the old risk assessment methods. But this conception negates the deliberate usage of these tools in the criminal justice system. But on the other hand, there is a conscious and unconscious embodiment of values to technical systems and artifacts. And the tension between value-free tools and value-embedded tools is ultimately a question of which normative discourse we stand to type. And again, due to the fat literature, there's an appropriation of fat values and ultimately the values that we embed is stemmed from our relation to technology. Those, again, which conception of technology one adheres to is quite vital. And uh, the value in, the, in this context of the tools and criminal justice system is very, very crucial is because the seriousness of the subject matter of criminal law and especially um, the values embedded in tools have long-term implications that surpass their designers and builders. How am I doing on time, by the way? Good, bad. You have 10 seconds. Oh no, 10 seconds, okay, not gonna happen. Uh, if you could address the conclusion, I think. Okay, I will try to, I mean, I did not presumption of innocence. How can I, okay, let me try to. Address the conclusion. Uh, up, 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 up. Um, um, I was going to talk about presumption of innocence, but maybe I can just say that uh, with the topic of presumption of innocence, there's a huge um, interplay between the tension and ethics of punishing the innocence and failing to commit the guilty. And we need to, we need to, we really need to think about how to oper operationalize legal concepts of presumption of innocence and human behavior into specific measures that enable the building and evaluation of these systems. And um, I'm so sorry, I'm out of time. So yeah, I think I'll just th say thank you. And I'm sorry that I went over time. Thank you very much, Ms. Johan. Uh, now we have one question uh, sent by the audience. Okay. Uh, is Can there another, oh, cool. what? Oh, sorry, if it's in the chat, I can't see, I have to stop sharing. Should I do that or? Okay, you can stop sharing. That's no worries. Perfect. Okay, so I'll send you also uh, in the chat. Uh, but the question is, is there another tool that you didn't consider in your paper and you recommended as an evolution of the research? If there's a tool I did not recommend. You are sending the question, right? Yeah. yeah. I have already sent it. Oh, I, I can't see it. I'm so sorry. I thought, uh, okay, I cannot see it though. Is, Maybe the, can you... the, uh, is there another two that you didn't consider in your paper and you recommended as an evolution of the research? I, told you, I, I didn't consider in your paper. I mean, I, I, I did not look at all the tools because there's more than I think like 12 tools. Uh, so I'm, I'm taking uh, probably because I'm still in the like in, in the next year, I'm still going to go more into ethno ethnographic research, uh, but I'm mainly using the two ones. But more or less, I don't want to be like too generalizing, but they hold the same principles. But the reason I chose Compass and uh, the, the PCA as two contrasting examples that the Compass was um, proprietary and has been even though the Supreme Court accepted it, it has been uh, quite criticized in all arenas by NGOs and whatnot. So public safety assessment tool is a kind of like alternative to it because it's more opaque, it's more explainable. And uh, so maybe that's how I can answer your question. I hope that's a good way to do it. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Yunan, once again. And now Ms. Zabini Bennett uh, will proceed with her full paper, with her presentation. Uh, her, her work uh, has the title uh, Honto, a knowledge base from textbooks from legal text retrieval and recommendation. recommendation. Ms. Verhet, you also have 20 minutes. Uh, good luck to you. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? 
Yes, you can. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yes, so my name is Sabine Wienert and I am an external PhD student at the University of Magdeburg in Germany. And I work full time uh, in two places, um, Georg Eckert Institute and Legal Horizon AG. And um, both institutes kind of also help me to shape my PhD. And this is now what I'm going to present. My topic is Honto, a knowledge base from textbook for legal text retrieval and recommendations. So the major task that the system should solve is to track changes in law for regulatory compliance and then recommend changes in law that could be relevant for a specific user. So in general, this is a very challenging task for practitioners since we live in a globalized world and there are usually multiple legislations that uh, multinational firms have to uh, consider and be up to date about. And that's kind of a challenge because there is such a high speed in which now uh, norms are changing, especially now in our times of Corona. Um, and the idea is basically that we have a user, for example, such a company that kind of verbalizes what are relevant topics or norms. So somehow the kind of characterization, what are the major activities of this uh, company? And um, then we want to find out if there is some overlap with what is currently discussed in the political discourse. So we do this because we want to find out if any law is changing that is maybe relevant for our user and that our user has to adapt to in order to stay compliant. And we chose parliament discussions because this is kind of the earliest point where we can estimate that things are going to change and there's enough time to adapt before the law is in force. So why isn't this easy? Um, when we have a user context, then whatever the user verbalizes, what is relevant for him or her, this might be very different from what is discussed in a political discourse. So there's maybe a huge term mismatch. There's also ambiguity and also different abstraction levels. And uh, this is why we came up with an idea of mediating between those two things, the user context and the political discourse via a knowledge base. And this knowledge base should be a scalable solution to monitor political discourse. And we want to use information retrieval methods for that. So it is a sort of a shallow knowledge representation. Um, and it is a bottom up knowledge base from literature about laws. And uh, in this context, I should also probably characterize further what I mean when I say literature about laws, because uh, we want to take resources that are normally used in law school, for example. When you have a certain area in law, such as tax law, then usually you probably have some books that you would like to refer to where you have also example situations described and specifically also about norms, which norms are applied together in a specific situation. And this knowledge, we usually don't get from the laws themselves from the original content. We only get this knowledge either from experience from domain experts or hopefully from the literature that we select. So the contribution of this thesis should be to explore how knowledge from textbooks can be extracted and organized to overcome the knowledge acquisition bottleneck and to enhance retrieval methods. I will have to very briefly just uh, sketch the state of the art because I don't have that much time. So there are already legal recommender systems for sure. For example, Open Laws EU, and also there is a recommender by Winkels and his colleagues that are quite also similar, but they differ in terms of the resources they take. So they are probably modeled on the original text of the laws and also based on ontologies that have been carefully handcrafted and that also apply reasoning and everything. But I think that we can do a bit of a different thing by using the textbook structures and therefore have more scalability in our system. Um, and this is one of the major differences. We haven't seen any other approach that uses textbooks 
to make a bottom-up knowledge base and then do this for retrieval and especially for subsequent compliance checking. Speaking of which, compliance checking systems. So there are for sure many rule-based approaches with BPMN, for example, and axiomatic ontologies. And we don't even aim to be similar to that because this is not our goal. We want to be the step before it. We want to detect which laws are potentially relevant and then such a system could be applied afterwards to find out whether compliance is still given or not on the BPMN level. So we think this is rather complementary and not uh, kind of competing with this type of approach. And uh, yeah, so we focus on the retrieval task that can also come before compliance checking process. Another thing is when we have the retrieval task that we have a rather high recall requirement because if you imagine that we just miss one single important change in law, this could be a very high cost because the companies could not be compliant and then could probably get some punishment for it. And in that regard, there's also literature that focuses on how to create ground truth for high recall scenarios because it's pretty hard to have experts annotate all examples in a big corpus and say okay this is now relevant or this is not relevant and here there's for example a work that says we can show excerpts to the annotator instead of the whole work to make the evaluation easier and faster and uh, in that way we also try to construct our knowledge base in a way that we don't have so much information overflow that we work with keywords ideally and then the last thing is usability we, we don't really want to overwhelm the users in exploration because imagine you have 200 textbooks that you want to extract some concept hierarchies from uh, this might get a bit hard to oversee and that's why there's also related work that uh, kind of argues you should not let your user explore everything just freely, but kind of guide the user as well. And um, what you can also do is to offer explanations of your recommendations uh, via visualization, for example, of distances using TSNE between word embeddings and uh, also maybe word frequencies for the overlaps. And so the idea here is also to test several techniques for UI creation and explainability to make this huge construct somehow manageable for a user. All right, so now I want to present the three milestones that I have defined for my PhD. The first one is to build the knowledge base. I mean, this is the core of it. The second one is to test retrieval techniques and then also to see if we really need that knowledge base or if we can also simply just try to match the political discourse to the user context and then be happy. Um, and then the third thing is to evaluate the user subscription model by checking the usability as I just described before. And then we have to find some requirements for our system that should be met. The first one is explainability. So this is an ideal requirement we will probably not get full explainability, but it may also depend on our users' preferences. So we can have several techniques that can be selected, deep learning techniques or other bag of words approaches and uh, similar things or also topic models. Um, and there we can also test different retrieval algorithms and see how they perform. Second is we want to have reliability. So just in the context of the high recall scenario, if you imagine, we don't want to miss much, ideally nothing. And then stability over time is a requirement that refers to users that work with the knowledge base that have kind of already explored it a bit. If we add new books into it or remove books, then the structure of the knowledge base should not change that much. So here we could work with must link constraints if there is something recomputed such as with topic models and uh, this is also a requirement we want to meet. And then topical relevance is the last one where we want to say that the entity context that is then uh, 
used as a basis to perform the recommendations. This has to be matched with the user interest. So we don't want to just blindly recommend a norm when it uh, has some overlap with the terms, but we also want to see if the context is right. All right, so now we have research questions for each of those milestones. And the first one is how can we extract knowledge from textbooks to mediate between substantially different documents? This question can be answered by trying to find out the state of the art on information extraction recommendations. So kind of um, making experiments for the whole pipeline of this knowledge extraction on a fixed set of queries and subscriptions. Then we also, since we extract this knowledge from the textbooks, we will have to work with segmentation of the textbooks to get the extraction of table of contents parts and section titles right to match also correctly all the citations that are in a book to its corresponding chapter, subchapter, and so on. Since there are PDFs that we would like to analyze that don't have it in their metadata. Then we want to assess the extraction error on a small study. And finally, we want to also characterize the benefit of using textbook knowledge over some other external knowledge that is uh, probably also good. For the next milestone, we have the question, how do different degrees of explainability impact retrieval performance? So we kind of assume that there is a trade-off between explainability and performance in retrieval. And if this really holds, we want to find out. So we can have, of course, step-by-step -step evidence, or on the other hand, we can also show neuron activation on a given input and then see what is more useful to the user and, uh, and kind of characterize what is uh, now here the preference. Also, yes, as I already said, we want to compare to retrieval without the knowledge base to kind of justify its existence and we have considered evaluation metrics for the retrieval tasks such as F2 score and the MAP score to emphasize ranking performance and recall. Also, we want to analyze subpopulations of interest for different legal document types. I usually speak of norms because norms have this big challenge of abstract content and then it should match to a specific situation. But we could also work with cases and see if they can also be recommended equally well. And then the final research question is about how can we present the knowledge base to a user to find and subscribe to relevant concepts effectively. So this is then again about how the information is presented and digested by the user. So here we can study the user interfaces of the knowledge base with eye trackers. For example, we can try to find out the time to find relevant concepts, also make a survey on the user experience. And also we can assess the alerting behavior because it might make a big difference if you get alerts all the time that are irrelevant, but also it's not a good thing to get not enough alerts and then miss a thing. And this is now what we have done. This was the first paper that we published about this topic and it is about the knowledge base, basically what we call HONTO, that was published in a workshop at the CIKM. And here we have defined the process that is mostly still valid nowadays, at least in the beginning. So we have a book, we apply some standard NLP pre-processing such as tokenization, part of speech tagging, and then we annotate concepts such as the table of contents, then the sentence that contains the citation or a reference, and then finally the reference. Those concepts are annotated automatically by using regular expressions and also rules that define part of speech here. Yes, and then this is further extracted and then you have per book one concept hierarchy that is composed of exactly those parts. The reference at the bottom, then some keywords that characterize this reference within the same sentence that it has been cited in, and then we have just the hierarchical structure of the table of contents. Looks like this. So here you can see three different concept hierarchies. So just imagine these are three different books and they all cite the article 823 of the German civil code that is called BGB. And uh, you can also see that there are combinations with other articles. And then 
above those, you have further characteristics about the context in which this article has been cited in. For example, discrimination and crime, or also compensation by the organizer for shortcomings during a holiday. So in this way, we want to also link those hierarchies just if the context is same. So this is the kind of topical relevance that we were talking about. Only those two leftmost uh, hierarchies should be linked and not the one that is at the right side because it's a different context. So that is here the main idea. And we have made a small graph implementation and also a fuzzy search with Elasticsearch um, in a small workshop paper here that was a German venue. Finally, we also want to add into this graph the original instances or entities of the legal documents. So there should be also a note below those hierarchies that is, for example, just for the Article 823 BGB. And this will then be linked with all of those references. And for this, we need to also make entity resolution and find out, well, is there really some part pointing to this legal document or not in a reference? And then, as I said also, we have the very contextual ones that we call here connections. So there are different ways of uh, citing those laws in different complexity levels. So we have exact matches when we perform this uh, entity resolution. We have also approximate ones that don't have an exact overlap. We can have range queries and also connections with multiple other articles. And then finally, we would like to retrieve laws based on a given context that the user has probably before subscribed. And for example, users interested in discrimination and crime, then this is uh, then a subscription. And then we would retrieve 823 and 253 of the BGB. We would also know that this is somehow linked to immaterial damages because there is a connection to the other hierarchy that then further gives this context. Yes, so those requirements have been defined in the paper at the URIX in 2019. We have already talked about them. And for the second milestone now, which is about the retrieval, we have used the data sets of the Collie competition that you probably know from this conference. And especially we are interested in task three, which is the legal information retrieval on statute law. And there we try to be competitive with an explainable method, but also try out the whole spectrum of deep learning that is not so explainable and see how we can characterize this assumed trade-off between explainability and performance. So regarding the statutes of this first milestone to build the knowledge base, we have already defined the concept for the knowledge base. That's the first paper that I have mentioned here. We have tested the gate software and also Imaruta for the information extraction and we decided to opt in for Imaruta finally. Then we have made a graph implementation in Neo4j and also made the graph searchable and we have developed a concept for entity resolution and also made a simple UI for testing the book extraction at this company, Legal Horizon, that I'm working at, and uh, there are ongoing updates and code reviews. For the second milestone, we want to test retrieval techniques, right? So there we have already made a very small test on an early prototype in that URIX paper that I already mentioned. And at the Collie competition in particular, we have already tested combinations of TFIDF and word embeddings for the information retrieval task. We have tested the so-called hot metric, which is combining topic models and word embeddings together. We have also tested various baselines such as BM25, TFIDF, also I think BiLSTM. Yes, and this year we have tried the BERT and TFIDF combinations and especially with sentence BERT, we were pretty successful this time. Then for the third milestone, we want to, or we basically already have designed the user subscription model um, at this workshop where we have presented the graph implementation, but there's much to do still on the usability part. So just to summarize, we have now 
explained what we plan and what is already existing on research towards the Honto system. The Honto system is a knowledge base to mediate between different types of documents of different abstraction levels. And this mediation shall come through concept hierarchies from textbooks, which further characterize those legal document entities. What we want to do in this thesis also is to compare deep learning and more explainable retrieval methods, maybe also characterize a trade-off if it exists. And also we want to have a user explore this knowledge base and subscribe to relevant concepts or entities for obtaining recommendations. Now this is this kind of alert that I mentioned. So it should be some kind of system that also pushes notifications. Yes. So this thesis defense is planned for 2023. And with this, I conclude my talk. These are some selected sources. Now I am open for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Bernard. Uh, we have the following questions uh, sent uh, from the audience, by the audience to you. I will send also at the chat. The first one is how do you plan to incorporate priority in the user context? There is which norms might be most or more relevant for the user, even that you aim for a high recall scenario. Is there any idea or on how to re-rank re relevant norms by user preference? Now, this is a very good question. I must admit I haven't thought about making a prioritization within the user context, but I think that we could kind of circumvent this problem a little bit by letting the user also assign a priority and also put this responsibility to the user a bit to simply mark all the concepts that are relevant for the user. And I think it will be also um, a service that the Legal Horizon company will offer to offer their consulting on how to um, on how to subscribe to those concepts. Okay, we have one last uh, question. Uh, how to apply Hunto if the plan norm creates a new broad concept not described in another norm before? How does it classify as relevant or not? Yes, I mean, this new concept is a bit hard to say because when the user does not know that this exists and we have not any information about that it could be relevant to the user, then we maybe need to implement an extra mechanism that kind of says this is out of scope of our knowledge base. Is this still interesting for you? Yes, but uh, I have not really put any thought on this issue. Thank you very much for pointing it out. Okay, once more, thank you, Ms. Bennett. And I now, finally, Mr. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I would be happy to have a follow-up question or comment uh, on the last question. So, German jurisprudence is famous for, uh, well, hundreds of years uh, of uh, development of very complex, multi-level uh, conceptual systems. And now the question is whether uh, this uh, tradition uh, has some bearing on your research. So do you make use uh, in your annotation, for instance, in the uh, of the classifications of norms, classifications of rights, uh, and so on and so forth, or, which have been developed in German jurisprudence for dozens of years? This is a good comment because I think it could be built in for the prioritization as well and the re-ranking maybe uh, to then say, okay, this is now a more important, I don't know, a uh, more important law than the other one. And here we can then probably apply some of this also in a rule-based fashion. Yes. Uh, I think so. And I also think that the making use of this knowledge type may solve many problems of new concepts because these conceptual systems uh, tended to be exhaustive, uh, to, to, to build a, 
uh, exhaustive complete classifications of any entity or object that can be considered uh, by legal regulation. So this may be a nice uh, subject for future work. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Uh, finally, Mr. Joel Niklaus will present the paper that has uh, his full paper that has the title Israel, an intro and uh, system for reidentification and anonymization of Swiss court decisions. Uh, Mr. Niklaus, you will have also 20 minutes for your speech. Uh, the best of luck to you. Great, thank you very much. Can you see my screen and do you hear me well? Yes, we can. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so welcome to my presentation about ESRA, an end-to-end uh, -end system for re-identification and anonymization of Swiss court decisions. This work is being conducted um, as part of the NRP 77 project, Open Justice versus Privacy, where, uh, which is a collaboration of um, lawyers and computer scientists at the University of Bern. So what is it about? Um, we, we are in the balance between the, an open justice system and the people's privacy. So court rulings should be public to facilitate jurisprudence and um, make this justice system accountable. But on the other hand, privacy is a fundamental human right. So because of this, court decisions in Switzerland are anonymized right now. But this happens mostly manually, which is expensive, error-prone, and not scalable. Additionally, there is the risk of re-identification. So on the right side, you can see an example uh, from Sweeney, where, where they, um, they were able to link two databases by the means of uh, date of birth, uh, sex, or zip code, even though both uh, were anonymized. Um, a similar work um, managed to re-identify 21 of 25 highly specific uh, court cases in Switzerland um, by linking external data. So they, they did a lot of pre-processing and it was a lot of manual work, but it was possible to re-identify a, a large part of these decisions. So in our work, we, we want to extend this to make it more general and applicable on a, on a larger amount of cases. So the goal of this is to, to um, find out how high the risk of re-identification re is. So for this, we have the research question one, which is for what percentage of anonymized Swiss court decisions is it possible to re-identify entities and what is the, anti the effort requir required and to what extent can it be automated? So on the right side, you can see um, a high level overview of the, of the process which we, we plan to, to use to perform this re-identification. So it's a, it's a combination of um, the court rulings and uh, the external data um, which we, um, where we will in extract the information to build knowledge graphs and perform record linkage or ontology mapping. But more on this later. Um, leading on from this first research question, we get the second one, which is how can the findings of this re identification program be used to strengthen existing anonymization procedures? So again, on the right side, you have a quick overview. So we, we plan to use the re-identification results to provide guidelines to the courts and um, influence the anonymization process. This is another, another overview where the re-identification tool uh, corresponds to the verification tool. So we can verify if, a, if an um, if a court decision is anonymized sufficiently with our tool so that it can be released or we can, um, we can perform a cost benefit analysis. 
So what are challenges in our project? So far, there is, there is almost no, no open curated data available in, in the Swiss legal domain, unfortunately. Um, there is the, the government and other entities, they, they publish the data, but it is not um, ready for use in, uh, in NLP. Additionally, in, in Switzerland, the landscape is, um, the political landscape is very fragmented. We, we have 26 different cantons each with different regulations, laws, court systems, and so on. And, even, and these cantons are um, further divided in, in uh, three different languages. Some of the cantons have more than one language. Um, also in our data set, we have all levels of appeal. So it's, um, it encompasses the, the entire uh, landscape of decisions in Switzerland. Additionally, the languages are not English, which makes it a bit harder in NLP because of less available resources and pre-trained models and so on. Um, also, of course, like you, you, like you all know, we have the specialized legal language. So here I am presenting you the proposed methodology which we plan to, to use in the next two to three years. So first, we plan to obtain and curate the data set of Swiss court decisions. Then to, to process these court decisions um, effectively, we want to pre-train a language model on, the, on Swiss legal data in general. And then annotate Swiss federal court decisions with named entities so we can can you um, recognize them easily with, because they are most important for re-identification and on anonymization. And finally, with these entities, we want to re-identify the anonymized ones. So here we have two solutions, uh, which I will explain also more in detail afterwards. So the first one being, we just search for with uh, identifiers we extracted um, in, the, in the external data, or otherwise we perform the ontology mapping of two knowledge graphs. So the first step is already done, or to, to the, to mo most of it is already done. So we collected the data set, we pre-processed it, and um, we are still working on extracting um, relevant information from the decisions. So just to give you a quick overview, it contains more than 600,000 decisions, um, the, most of them being in German, but a considerable part of it in French, and then a smaller part in Italian. Um, on the, uh, below, you can see um, at, um, the distribution over the, over the, the dates. So on the x-axis, you have the number of decisions, so here, uh, in 2020, we have 30,000 decisions um, published in the in Swiss in the Swiss German um, area, and it started at around 500 decisions in 1990. So the second part is that we want to pre-train a Swiss legal bird. Um, there we have the challenges. challenge that uh, many legal documents are very long, so way above the 512 token limit of BERT. Um, in the Swiss court decisions, we have an average of 1k to 10k tokens. So we, we would propose to pre-train a big BERT model so we can um, process these longer texts uh, more easily. As data, we have laws, court decisions, and maybe legal articles, if we can get a hold of them. Um, that's also, that's a bit of a problem because they're, they're um, not very freely available and in the hands of, of commercial um, entities. So quest open questions here are still, if we should include data from Germany, France, or Italy, or other, um, 
um, countries which speak one of those languages um, in, a, in a earlier pre-training stage and also if we should pre-train a multilingual model or monolingual models. Then the third step is to annotate a named entity recognition corpus. So because named entities are anonymized in court decisions, um, they, they provide the information if they are not anonymized, so we need to recognize them. And th this is a basis for the knowledge graph later on. So here we have some questions which are, which court should we include? Should we include, um, should we build a very broad data set um, with few annotations per court or rather a very um, deep data set with few courts, but a lot of annotations. And then also what categories to annotate. So how, how fine-grained should it be? As, extens as extensions, we could also annotate relations or core references in this, in this corpus. Um, the, the categories, some of them, um, we expect them to be easy to annotate. So we can, can use um, regular expressions or um, parsers or crowdsourcing. And others, we expect them to be rather hard. So we need to um, ask lawyers to do them. And then the final step, which is the re-identification. Here we have the, the following process um, imagined for the simple solution. So first we extract uh, identifiers from the decisions with named entity recognition and regexes. Then we search external data, so newspaper articles, Twitter, um, death notices, whatever, um, wherever we find references to court decisions for these extracted entities, the identifiers. And then we present the, the external document where we found the identifier to um, a human the identifier which can then perform the final step. So here we have a metric of success, which is the percentage of correctly identified external documents. Then to the complex solutions, complex solution. Here we would first con construct the knowledge graph on both uh, the external data and on the court decision, and then on perform ontology mapping between the, the two graphs. Um, we, if we find an entity being mapped between those two graphs, this would correspond to a re-identification, a possible one. And then we can show this match to a human re-identifier. Here we would measure the, the success by the percentage of correct matches. Um, so what can the community expect from our work? Um, apart from the, the direct contribution of the, the re-identification tool, we also will generate many open access data sets um, during our projects containing legal data from Switzerland and also connected external data, which we will uh, pre-process and make available for easy use in the NLP community. Um, additionally, we, all, we will also pre-train the Swiss legal bird model, which we will open source as well. So to wrap up, I'm a bit uh, earlier than expected. I'm sorry for that. Um, so we are in the um, in the field of a difficult balance between open justice and privacy. Um, and, and here we plan to perform an empirical study to estimate the effort required for re-identification. And with this, these results, uh, we hope to produce guidelines for a more effective anonymization procedures and while performing this research project, project, we will produce many spillover effects to the community like data sets and models. 
So this is it, and I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Niklaus. Uh, the question sent to you is if I will send to you also in the chat so you can read it. Okay. Just a second. If this is considered a proof of concept, how do you intend to scale? Do you have an estimate time this the software takes to anonymize compared to human work to do the same thing? Um, thank you very much for the question. So as I see this, these are two questions. So uh, I will first answer the one um, for, of the proof of concept. Um, yes, this is a, a proof of concept, definitely. Um, we plan to, to make it as big as possible, but it is a research project and we have uh, limited manpower. So um, in scaling, scaling this solution up is not part of the, the research project. It might be, um, we, we might refer this to the, the federal Supreme Court, which might develop this further afterwards. Um, and then, do you have an estimated time the software takes to anonymize compared to human work to do the same? Um, so far, we don't have an estimated time, but um, and also we focus on re-identification and not on anonymization first. So anonymization will only be part of the project in the later stages. Um, but if you if you are talking about the the time it takes to anonymize one decision, this should be very small. So in the range of seconds, we assume. Um, well, so I would like to thank all the speakers for of this panel and also our audience. Now we have uh, a break for 15 minutes those who want to, to meet other participants and extend experience can access the Gear Town platform for a network moment. Uh, the link is at the Open5 platform. Thank you all very much. See you soon.
11th International Con Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Law. My name is Lara Rocha Garcia, and this is the Doctor Consortium. Also, in the name of the International Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Law Organization, I'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Jus Brasil and Albert Einstein Israeli Hospital, our gold sponsors, Logarithms, Legal Code, and PG Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, Obsibloom Lawyers, and Oasis Open. First, I'd like to mention our platinum sponsors. Jus Brasil is currently the number one law and government website worldwide that makes high value legal information easy and quick to access. Albert Einstein Israeli Hospital, our platinum uh, sponsor, is one of the best known health units in Brazil and Latin America that is referencing treatments with state of the art technology and humanized care, expanding its borders with social responsibility, actions, teaching, and research activities. Now, I would like to introduce Ms. Aline McQueen, PhD candidate at uh, Universidade Federal do Paraná, who will present the full paper, Measurement of Consistency in Judicial Decisions. Ms. Aline McQueen, you have 20 minutes of speech. Afterwards, we are moving to questions. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. I will present my screen. Hello, everyone. I am Aline McQueen, and today I'm going to present my doctoral research with the title Measurement of Consistency in Judicial Decisions. The advisor of my doctoral thesis is Professor Cesar Serbena. With the increasing use of electronic processes in the availability of decisions in an electronic format, both in Brazil and other countries, data visualization techniques can be applied to judicial data database for the purpose of extracting knowledge and identifying uh, relevant properties that, uh, that are not visible without the, the use of appropriate data mining techniques. In this image, I illustrate an example of a Brazilian Superior Court decision and some data that can be easily extracted using regular expressions. Some data that can be extracted are name of the judge, parties, lawyers, cited legislation, and date of the court decision. All public judicial decisions in Brazil, despite not being, not being made available in the structured format, it's, it's possible to extract this information without more complex natural language processing techniques. Decisions in Brazil are not anonymized either. On the image to the right, we can see some applications of what's possible to do with this data, which I have already dealt with the previous works. The first, is a graph of citations between judicial precedents in order to identify relevant and similar precedents. In the second image is a graph to track decisions that were granted, dismissed, and partially granted over time. Finally, in the third image is a graph of the calculation of ideology according to the Kate Pool W nominate algorithm. This algorithm is interesting for measuring judges who tend to vote together and can be indicative of similar future votes. During this presentation, I will contextualize the Brazilian judiciary in order to understand how I intend to calculate judicial cons consistency from this data. Uh, how, what's in my problem of the paper? The choice of this team is associated with a problem that Brazil currently faces, and that may be a reality of several countries, which is the hyper judicialization of social relations. For many years, there has been an increase in the number of legal demands also made possible by the development of technologies that help lawyers deal with more lawsuits simultaneously. 
controlling how the ju judiciary will deal with this problem. It's called judicial accountability. And the way of measuring constancy can be a way of monitoring how judicial decisions are being taken. The parties and the lawyers appeal to a high court because they are not satisfied with a decision. The violation of understanding of a consolidated high court may justify this non-conformity in a, an appeal of high court. The data number of new cases increases the number of lawsuits opened in the form of an appeal, which are increased by the number of the new cases generated every day and the congestion rate. According to the data from the Justice in Numbers project of the National Council of Brazilian Justice, Brazil had 77 million cases pending at the end of December 2019. Therefore, by developing a metric that can help the courts to maintain their internal and external consistency with a high courts, we could increase certainty and reduce the rate of appeals in this instance, since this will allow them to dedicate themselves to the most complex cases in a swift manner. Although the work deals with a calculation of consistence of decisions that can be applied to any context or country, as long as it fulfills some requirements. I will, take, I will talk a little about the Brazilian judiciary to demonstrate the practical feasibility of the proposed study. In Brazil, we have courts of up to three instances. That is, a decision rendered in the first instance can be appealed or reversed in the second and the third instance. Some courts are responsible for judging specific issues such as electoral law or labor law and other judge various errors of law. There are still lawsuits that can start in the last instance, mm. according to the topic being discussed. The Brazilian Supreme Court, on the other hand, can function as for, for uh, instance. However, not all cases can be judged in it. There must be some discussion involving things about the federal constitution. In the present work, we will study the judicial consistency of decisions that are appealed from the Superior Court to the Brazilian Supreme Court. After contextualizing the functioning of the Brazilian judiciary, in this image I will illustrate some relationships between entities present in the court decision data. data. In item 4, we can see a court decision rendered by a panel of the judges who belong to a second, second instance court. This court decision is attached to a court case where the parties who fill the case and their respective lawyers are connected. The second instance court decision, in addition to having been judged by more than one judge, it mentions other court decisions to support its own decision. In addition, can mention legislation as well. Lawyer for the party who does not agree with the court decision can appeal to a high court, number two, and argue some reasons for overturning the decision. Although I have illustrated how it works in Brazil, but I believe it's very similar in other, in other countries. All these relationships can be mapped with a map mathematical or statistical calculation performed in order to support the calculation of consistency. In Brazilian legislation, the terms integrity and coherence have refers to the term consistency. In a similar sense, Pina Chances and the Linacre defines consistency as the extent of which like cases are treated alike. Meanwhile, the term treated alike can be interpreted in two ways. Some understand that the approach to sentencing should be constant across sentencing decisions. 
others understand that is the sentence that comes amongst like cases that must be alike. Well, to calculate the constants, you need a database to test. I already mapped thousands of court decisions from a Brazilian high court between 2001 and 2015. And this data can serve as basis for testing the algorithms, for identif identifying similar demands and calculating consistency. The data mapped include A, keywords or subjects that identify their documents, B, parts and their respective lawyers, C, cited legal precedents, D, cited legislation, E, judges who judge the decision, and F, decision type or grant or not granted in decision. The measurement of consistency make it possible to identify when the understanding of a topic has changed in the court, when there are or opposing understandings prevailing between courts or within the court itself, which could lead to legal uncertainty or even where there is a consolidated understanding. From this, from this image, we can identify five levels of cons consistency. Number one, individual consistency, cons consistency of each judge. Number two, consistency of first instance decision. Number three, consistency of second instance decision or court of appeals. Number four, consistency of the court in the third instance or high court. And number five, what you may call legal rules. Since in some countries, such as in Brazil, there may be a fourth instance or Supreme Court that can issue decisions that be prevailed over our, all the or other courts. Furthermore, in some issues, only the courts of the first or second instance establish a consolidated understanding. And however, diver divergent the courts of the second instance are, there is no general understanding of the higher courts. In a hypothetical case, all first instance decisions should be made following the understanding of the local courts and so on, as long as there are legal precedents in our instance. In another hypothetical case, a judge may have a high individual constants that is always judged the same way in specific case, but presents some level of inconsistency with his court of origin when there is an understanding in the opposite sense. However, to the fact that the courts have their judicial autonomy, that understanding may vary. This notion at the valid the study because even if a judge has a different understanding of a higher court, this understanding could be maintained until a law is enacted, modified, or change its understanding, but the understanding could never change several times in the same time span. It's also possible to highlight a problem that this type of research can cause if applied to the courts without due care, the stagnation of case law. This problem can be caused since decisions would only be made according to the overall understanding and it would cease to be discussed in the day remained valid over time. However, as I read mentioned, judges and the courts have, have their judicial autonomy. And if an algorithm identifies an inconsistency, this could help judges to demonstrate through their, their arguments why such an understanding should be changed. Research to gauge the constants of judicial decisions dates back 1996 with the work of American researchers such as Tony and Austin, who sought to establish directives for drafting and structuring judicial sentence. However, authors such as Hoffer 
criticizes the lack of independent evaluation regarding the impact of these directives on practical cases. Ending in 2011, also emphasizes the criticisms by noting, noting that we are a little empirical research in this respect. Another fact that influenced the conduct of, of empirical research on this topic worldwide was the lack of available and the detailed digital detail data for this analysis. Another issue raised was the lack of consensus on the concept of consistency occurred to decision and how it should be measured. Pina Sanchez and the Linacre also pointed out that, in addition to a lack of consensus, many methods do not go into the detail and have problems in terms of applicability, making it difficult to access consistency through various methods. Among the main errors made by the models was their lack of replicability and the possibility of comparing results. Another mistake made was with regard to generalization. With a few cases analyzed and then attempt to infer the constants of entire curves, especially those that are limited to specific crimes. Also included as undesirable behaviors are the judge's isolated consistency measure with the model tested using fictional data. As for the statistical techniques used, regression models were found to verify the influence of each variable on the final decision. However, as analyzed in the article, the predictability value of the model was not statistically significant. Yet, there were also works restricted to qualitative analysis. As a methodology of, of this, for this work, a bibliographic review was conducted, which included a studying papers that address the analysis of a large amount of judicial data, b measuring constants, and c identify that Brazilian law and the doctorates define a requirements for the standardization of case law and the identification of repetitive lawsuits. After the bibliographic review, a court is defined for these must have documents that are available for online extraction and are more likely to have repetitive demands to evaluate the constants of its decisions. After establishing the body of the origin of the judicial decisions, the extraction, pre-processing, transforming, data mining, and evaluation techniques can be applied. Among the transformation the data mining techniques we include evaluation the algorithms for calculation of ideology, rate of reform of judicial decisions, and calculation with graphs to evaluate the results obtained and decide whether it would be necessary to apply natural language processing methods or change existing algorithms. Due to the high volume of volume of judicial case for an, autom for an automated analysis that could be checked manually by specialists, we had to determine a cutoff for the data. The data. To, choose, to choose the team and identify the lawsuits widely published that understanding of the divergences of opinions between judges and the courts, which are known as general repercussion of the Brazilian Supreme Court, where was used. When an issue is marked as general repercussion of the Brazilian Supreme Court, the related cases are, are, are already identified. This methodological choice solves only on the main problems reported by Pina Sanchez and Linacre. Regarding the phase of mapping, dat ma ma mapping data in the form of the graphs, from the pre-processed and transformed data when studying the true graph theory, it's possible to measure cited precedents that are similar through metrics such as modularity and the majority in precedents. And as so the first phase of the calculating the ideology value, this metric 
considered the judges who vote similar can be clustered. Ultimately, this is experimental, experimental work because it's difficult to identify and automatically analyze the arguments of a court decision and the association of similar arguments. It was this decided to use these metrics mentioned above and validate their efficiency for adopting more complex methods. This criterion will be re-evaluated in future works. My contribution. The contribution on this, of this work consists in the creation of a model to measure the consistency of court decision. However, to achieve this result, it is necessary to extract and prepare the data that will be used. The work is in the experimental phase. In the future, the use of more complex techniques, such as argument mining, to identify similar court rulings can be considered. The present work also differs from the 11 methods discussed in work of Pina Sanchez and Linacre, and as it considers the influence of precedents and the rate of re decision reform. As interesting as, as some of the mentioned models may be, especially regression, model, regression models, they seek to assign as weight to each legal factors that can influence a decision. However, the purpose of this work is to verify for, for a really select case and with the same legal factors, whether the same understanding is being applied to any of the evaluate levels of constants. Some data from court decisions have already been mapped in accordance with the methodology and the validity of metrics such as modularity and aging, aging vector centrality has been tested. The validity of the calculation of the judge's ideology while, while was also tested using the metric developed by Kate Poole. Finally, with this data mapped and prepared for use in the model, we are, we are applying the following formula. In this calculation, the following are considered. Number one, number of votes in the majority position in favor or against regarding a certain issue where M, zero or one. Meanwhile, P, I refers to all the, ju all the cases judged judge by judge on the subject in question. Number two, number of votes that I mentioned the most frequently cited legal precedents. Number three, meanwhile, refers to all the cases ruled by a judge on the subject in question and which uses legal precedents. Finally. Uh, Mrs. Alini, uh, just three more minutes, please. Okay. Finally, the W variable is the weight attribute by the use of similar precedents on the team. Number four, the constants of the judge with the local court considers the votes of all judges in the court and checks the proportion of similar votes with the judge analyzed. The decision reform rates is also considered. Ultimately, constants calculation for the high courts follow the same model as for the local court. It is a simple but experimental model to access whether the value found matches, matches what is decided in the legal proceedings, that is, same results in case with same legal factors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alini, for your great presentation. Now we are going to move on for questions, is okay? Okay. Okay, first question. What do you mean when you mention judges' ideology as a form of measuring consistency? Okay. When I mention ideology, I'm not referring to a qualitative concept, but a quantitative one. Ideology is a metric that represents a value between minus one and plus one. According to this metric, I can identify judges who vote similar 
according to the value they have in this metric. This value may imply more favorable, favor, more favorable or less favorable to some subjects. Okay, great. Thank you. We have more questions here. Uh, in your paper, you mentioned that the automated analysis of data is limited to people with programming and statistical knowledge. Is there any way to make it widely available to lawyers who do not have programming skills? Okay. The Brazilian judiciary for now does not provide tools to facilitate this automated analysis by people who do not have some minimal knowledge in data extraction and manipulation. Currently, there are many tools that make this work easier, but they require a, bas a basic knowledge of programming. Another option is to hire, hire companies that offer this type of service and they are called law techs. Okay. Great. Uh, we have uh, time for more minutes. Okay. I'll move on. Why did the author map the decisions from 2001 to 2015? Okay. The year 2001 was defined because before this period, decisions are made available in digitized format. That is, the printed core decision was digitized and make the automated analysis more costly. As for the final period, uh, 2015, it's due to the database that I have available in the organized way. Usually, the task of stretching and cleaning the database takes a lot of time. Even with this temporal limitation, I have more than 1 million court decisions available, which I believe it's a good sample. Okay. Um, okay, we have more questions. Is the model objective to aid courts only? or could it be used by lawyers as a tool of prediction reliability? Okay. This model can help agencies that oversee the judiciary. As over the usefulness, the this calculation for lawyers, I see it's interesting to check if there is a great legal certainty in certain matters. This value could influence the decisions that the lawyer will take regarding the process and even in case, in case of judicial conciliation. Okay, uh, one more. When analyzing ju judicial decisions, sorry, I will start again. When analyzing judicial decisions that have not reached the highest court, it can be a significant challenge to identify the consolidating understanding and who is being consistent. Uh, this is a um, this is a, a phrase from you, I think. Is it even possible to identify who is being inconsistent? If so, what forms of measuring a measurement would be more relevant? Uh, do you understand the question? Yes. Uh, there are two ways one simple and one more, com more complex. The simplest would be to verify the group of decisions cited mostly through graph theory techniques. Any decision cited outside of this group could be considered non-standard, possibly inconsistency. Likewise, it ap ap applies to the affirmative legislation. The most complex way and which, and which can bring better results would be the argument mining and the verific verification of similar arguments. But I see it's a great challenge to put, to put into practice. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, our last question uh, from the audience. Has there been any progress regarding the use of the metrics presented in the paper? I.e., has the research had any further development since the paper was written? 
had no advances. Uh, so far, I've developed some articles that demonstrate the validity of using some metrics. And the next step, I gather these metrics to calculate consistency. Okay, we just received the last question and it's the last question uh, because of the time. Uh, it has been shown that ML prediction systems failed to learn the rationale that was applied when the cases were decided, even when they appear to have a high level of accuracy. So even if they make the same decision in a large proportion of cases, and I don't see the current success rate of less than 8% as large, they are not applying the law, but an incorrect understanding of the law. How can this ever be legitimate? Uh, it's a big problem. And, and the, the, my, the data mining techniques can reproduce the past. So if the, the, the data was wrong, uh, possibly the, fu the future suggestions was wrong too. I, I answer the question. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, okay, Professor Michael, would you like to make any questions or should we move to the next presentation? Thank you very much. There are many questions. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Alini McQueen, for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce Mrs. Adriana Jacot Unger, who is PhD candidate at University of Sao Paulo, and will present the full paper, Artifact Design for Design Science Research on Process Mining for Legal Compliance. Ms. Adriana Jacot Unger, you have 20 minutes of speech. Afterwards, we will move on, on we will move on to the questions. The stage is yours. Thank you, Lara. I will share my screen. I hope you can see. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, okay, we can see it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Adriana Unger and I am a PhD, PhD student in information systems at University of Sao Paulo. Uh, as a background, I have an engineer degree and a master degree in industrial engineering, but also a professional experience in BPM, business process management and consulting experience in the law field. Uh, as a PhD student, I'm a member of the process mining research group at University of Sao Paulo which is a group of researchers interested in the development of the process mining field. Uh, and my advisor, Marcelo Fantinato, and my co-advisor, Sarajani Perez, they are the leading researchers of this uh, research group. Uh, my work specifically is about the application of process mining to the law field. And here today, I will present to this paper, which is uh, a preliminary result of an early research project on process mining for legal compliance. And I propose a new approach to access uh, legal compliance in organizations using a process mining technique named conformance check. And this paper presents the design of an IT artifact that supports the execution of a preliminary controlled experience, uh, experiment that will evaluate this proposed approach. The artifact design make up a one design cycle uh, of this broader design science research project on process mining for legal compliance. So uh, talking about legal compliance, which is my motivation, uh, in the last decades, there are a growing number of applicable laws that has increased the regulatory pressure over business operation of several organizations around the world. And in this context, uh, many solutions to support assessment of legal compliance have emerged uh, based on the application of new technologies. For example, we can see here uh, an overview of uh, the innovative um, ecosystems of uh, startups that are named LawTechs uh, here in Brazil and in the US. 
And we can see that in this environment, uh, com legal compliance plays an important role uh, in the innovation and the development of uh, new tools and new technologies dedicated to assess uh, legal compliance. Uh, there are some experts that say uh, that there is a trend named Compliancy 4.0, which is uh, similar to the Industrial Revolution, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and is related to the trend of uh, uh, technology, new technologies, applications for uh, to, to, to manage compliance inside uh, the organizations. Well, uh, since my approach is based on process mining, I will take some time to explain what process mining is. So uh, it's a new field of study that enables event logs that are uh, registered executions of uh, activities inside organizations. Uh, these event logs, they are registered in, in information systems. And process mining allows that these event logs are mined into process models that help to understand uh, operation processes uh, inside organizations. Uh, so uh, in this way, process mining is considered the bridge between the process science, which is uh, based on the BPM uh, framework, uh, business process management, and to bridge this BPM uh, science, to this process science to data science disciplines. Uh, the process models, they play a dominant role in, in BPM because they tend to chains of activities that produce outcomes that add value to organizations and their customers. And the main innovation of process mining uh, uh, is related to the automatic discovery of business process models based on these event logs. Uh, and and, and the, the goal of this is to represent the reality of the execution of business processes instead of discovering process models manually. And then when, when these process models are discovered, they can then be analyzed and improved. Uh, the, the process discovery algorithms, they build process models from event logs uh, which review the sequence of activities that are performed during the, the process. And the process analysis can then be applied to support performance improvements of these processes, such as identifying bottlenecks, reducing costs, lead times, and things like that. Well, in my, in my approach to assess uh, legal compliance, uh, I, I apply another modality of process mining, which is the conformance check. Uh, conformance check involves comparing a, a reference process model to the event logs in order to verify uh, if a certain behavior in the real world is in accordance to a previously, previously defined agreement. So in this regard, process mining enabled conformance check is a promising approach that allows continuous monitoring of legal compliance based on the comparison of normative and observed behavior of business processes. Uh, this, this is important that uh, using process mining conformance check, it allows uh, a change in the paradigm of uh, compliance management because uh, most large organizations specifically, they uh, usually adopt international standards, so such as ISO, uh, to implement compliance management systems. And to support these uh, systems, they perform uh, conventional audits that usually are periodic. Uh, they involve analyzing sampling of information and retroactive documentation. And if we use process mining instead, uh, if we use the conformance check, we could, for example, uh, uh, monitor the compliance in real time, even in real time, if we have the, the, the continuous generation of event logs and anal analysis. And we can also uh, 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 analyze the complete log, the complete register of all the executions that were uh, performed in, inside an organization, not just 
uh, sampling and to have a measure of the conformance uh, rates throughout time and not only periodically or even uh, applying other uh, process mining techniques, we could uh, uh, prevent some non-conformance that would occur. Well, another uh, um, uh, property of my approach is that uh, instead of using imperative uh, process models, which are more, co more common, uh, such as the one that I, that I showed before, uh, this, this type of imperative process model, they describe a step-by-step -step work of each activity that occur during a, a business process. I am proposing to use declarative process models. These declarative process models, they, they allow the specification of a process in a loosely structured way as a set of constraints of rules that should be followed during the execution of the business process. So, uh, some declarative process models can be expressed by declare, which is a declarative language grounded in temporal logic. And I believe that process mining conformance check algorithms and tools uh, using declarative process models offer a promising framework to verify legal compliance because this type of representation of process model is more similar to how legal requirements are defined. I also uh, 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 included in my approach uh, the use of the computable law framework. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is to use the techniques to formalize legal rules into compliance requirements of business process models. And I want you to, to, to use the set of uh, legal rules uh, as a code uh, uh, using the computational models of law uh, based on ontologies dedicated to specific law fields. And these approaches of uh, computable law, they enable the application of semantic web technologies to model legal documents, allowing them to be consumed by electronic services, machine consumable legislation. Uh, the representation of this legal knowledge in the business rules domain can be achieved using, for example, legal rule ML, and, and I consider this um, Robaldo et al. Uh, framework uh, of uh, computable law and also the input and output logic system for the legal domain in which the com computational law uh, offers uh, semantic web-based technologies allowing the use of logic to formalize constitutive and pres 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 prescriptive rules written in natural language as machine consumable legislation. Uh, I also consider the governatory and Sajik frameworks, but uh, in the case of this framework, it consider a business process, an imperative business process in place where semantic annotations of these models can be done and then be compared to a rule base as a reference. Uh, this framework considered that uh, this, uh, uh, it aims to, to guide the, the design of processes that are complained by design and consider that the runtime checking uh, are implemented by workflow engines. In my case, I consider that the, the, the underlying business process, they are not known. Uh, uh, I, I, I suggest I suggest using declarative uh, business uh, uh, process models as a reference, and they will be compared to directly to the event logs to uh, apply conformance checking and then access uh, legal compliance of the execution of the process itself without knowing the business process in advance. Well, uh, the research goal of my broader research project uh, is to demonstrate that this uh, legal compliance approach based on law formalization and uh, conformance check uh, can support uh, legal compliance assessments uh, using uh, this uh, declarative business process models. But here, as a preliminary uh, step of the design cycle of the, my, my research, uh, I am proposing 
uh, an artifact uh, that could be tested under uh, uh, laboratory conditions to assess the feasibility of this uh, design idea. Uh, so, uh, considering the design science research, uh, I, uh, there are some um, uh, practical and theory cycles that are, uh, that are executed, and this artifact design would be the first design cycle that would be, then be uh, subject to experiment. Uh, so, uh, talking about uh, my proposed approach, uh, it represents the, the broader uh, compliance conformance check for legal compliance, in which I have the, the normative model, uh, the specific APIs to, to extract structure and unstructured data from the legal domain in the form of event logs, and then the logical representation of laws uh, would uh, complete the environment so that the discovered uh, process models could be checked against the, the legal requirements. So my uh, artifact design, it uh, was uh, um, restricted to a small experiment uh, so that we could uh, validate the proposed approach. This uh, restricted scope involves the un unauthorized access of personal data subject to data protection regulation. The business IT context is composed by information systems that log the execution of business process related to protection data, pro uh, uh, to protection of personal data, and database audit trails that register information about data access. A uh, mapping between the legislation scope and business process is presumably known. And the artifact comprises a normative declarative process based on the DAPRECO project coded rules about unauthorized personal data access, a synthetic event log based on data extracted from the business information systems, and a process mining enable conformance check tool named the room to access uh, legal compliance. So I will describe uh, each, each component of uh, this artifact, but I am also uh, considering uh, in purpose uh, two conflicting law cases that I also took as an example from the, the DAPRECO paper, uh, in which uh, 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 a case law one from, from Italy, which it considers uh, unauthorized access counting as a data breach and unauthorized access, another case law considered that it does not count as a data breach, uh, inspired by different count, court interpretations of GDPR on unauthorized access. So I will consider these two normative settings uh, to artificially provoke a situation of a compliant or a non-compliant in my experiment. So uh, my normative uh, process model of these artifacts are being built upon uh, rewriting legal rule ML statements of the declare uh, into declare language, considering these two normative settings and resulting in two declarative process models. I am considering the, the DAPRECO knowledge base uh, from Livio Robaldo and the conformance check of each of these models against the process, the, the event logs shall produce respectively legally non-compliant and compliant results. Uh, I also uh, will generate this synthetic event log, uh, considering a typical personal data protection management process that was modeled in this picture. Uh, and I will use a process log generation, the generator named BIMP, uh, to, uh, as a process execution scenario that will be based on this model. Uh, this uh, synthetic log file uh, will then be merged with a corresponding database of this trail containing data access information during the same time frame. frame. And the case IG considered for the process mining purpose will be the personal data identification, uh, unique related to the database record ID. And 
then uh, the synthetic event uh, will be generated containing events regarding authorized access. And the, the purpose is that I will use uh, these synthetic logs now in this small experiment. But in my uh, broader research project, I intend to use real logs uh, from real organizations. I will also use the rule miner tool from Almond et al. Uh, to complete this uh, artifact design. Uh, this was chosen because it has many functionalities, a visual editor for declarative process models and a conformance checking environments, which in indeed includes uh, data constraints that I will need in my case together with control flow constraints. So uh, this uh, declarative rooms also have a declarative process model editor in which both, both versions of the normative process model of the artifact can be this, defined using the declare uh, language. Uh, the room conformance check will take as input the event log and one of the normative process models at a time return activations, violations and fulfillments, fulfillments of each log of the log of each constraint in the model. Uh, the conformance check results in room, they are presented in groups representing the results for a specific trace or a specific constraint. So legal compliance of the event log will then be assessed based on the verification of this observed behavior, namely the event logs and the business process in accordance to, non to the normative setting being considered. Well, as a conclusion, I, I, uh, I remarked that uh, this uh, law as called approach uh, uh, offers a symbolic AI approach, which is more suitable, in my opinion, to the legal domain. Uh, if I compare to other solutions that uh, apply uh, text mining techniques, uh, uh, which independ on the legal content of the norms, uh, this proposed approach relies on an interdisciplinary and integrative research approach to design an innovative solution that combines techniques from computer science and the law areas. And furthermore, the, the proposed approach can be compared to existing business process compliance management frameworks. And although many of them adopt uh, semantic techniques to verify compliance of business process, they originally do not uh, consider automatic discovery of business process models, which is uh, the, what process mining proposes to do, or even real-time conformance checking as provided by this process mining uh, techniques. Uh, I expect that uh, the right combination of these techniques included in this design of, of each company of this the artifact leads to the demonstration of the process mining for legal compliance approach, resulting in a novel legal compliance checking framework for process models uh, in organizations. Uh, later, the empirical evaluation of this artifact during the execution of the experiment, which is still being prepared, may reveal uh, other barriers to the use of process mining enable conformance. So it's also my goal to map uh, these uh, limitations to this approach to check uh, legal compliance and also to use this to refine the, the design of the artifact for the next design science research cycles. And not uh, even considering... Uh, oh, last oh. minute, please. Okay, I'm finishing. Uh, even considering the early stage, of my research project and the limited scope of the, 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 this experiment, uh, this the proposed approach is expected to, to, that it can be generalized to other legislation and applied to different uh, business processes domain. And so uh, I thank you very much for being here and to present this uh, project here in the IKO conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Adriana, for your presentation, great presentation. And now I'm going to, to, to read, we have some questions, okay? Okay. 
According to the author, the logic of legal rules can be formalized as a code. How does that occur? How does that occur? I mean, uh, how can a legal rule be formalized as a code? Great, great question. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, many uh, works presented here in the ICAO main conference, they, they uh, suggest uh, there are many ways of doing that. But uh, my approach relies on the University of Bologna approach of uh, formalization of uh, legal codes based on XML uh, using frameworks such as the Accomontoso and using uh, uh, languages that are specific to the formalization of legal codes such as legal rule ML and also in the use of uh, uh, legal ontologies such as Pronto which I am using in this work and is a privacy ontology uh, uh, specific to uh, support uh, formalizing of uh, legal rules related to uh, personal data protection. So uh, as a, a more broad uh, answer, there are many ways to do that. And ICAO has a lot of uh, working about, uh, works about that. And in my approach, I adopted a specific uh, approach. Okay, great. Uh, we have two more questions until now. Uh, would the model be applicable to principles or standards or only to rules in a strict sense? Well, uh, there are lots of works in the business process management compliance field that consider uh, compliance in a more broad, broad um, view. So, uh, if we take these uh, approaches, these frameworks, and we could, for example, use a, a, a similar approach to check compliance, not only legal compliance, but compliance to any normative uh, uh, setting. Uh, in my case, I, I am focusing my, my work in the legal compliance because I, I, I understand that uh, the legal field is different from the other ones. They uh, have uh, special, uh, special um, properties of the legal rules. And I understand that uh, the legal rules, they have a nature that is different from a, a, a pure text concerning other domains. Uh, so in my case, I am, I am uh, focusing on this uh, legal compliance, but I understand that I, I know that there are other uh, more general frameworks. Okay, uh, another question. Not all legal requirements have a procedural nature, it's according to you. So uh, to what kind of legal requirements do you refer here? Well, in, in, in the case of data protection uh, legislation, uh, there are some uh, requirements that are uh, very procedural in, in a way that you must do something before and then you, do, you, you have to do another. You, you have some uh, prescript, prescriptive rules, sorry, that uh, in the norm tells you that, for example, uh, the 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 personal da da data must be collected and then treated and then deleted. So you have a sequence of activities in this case, and that's why I also uh, chose the, the data protection legal domain to design this experiment. But I understand that there are other legal rules that, are, that don't have this uh, sequential, this procedural nature. In this case, I understand that uh, checking legal compliance uh, will demand other techniques, maybe uh, to be used uh, jointly to process mining. But I want to use this experiment to map this, to map these limitations, and to also uh, define uh, the the, uh, the richness of the, my proposed approach. I hope I have answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Okay, uh, we think we have one more question. Okay. 
is it possible to provide a concrete example of application of the model? Of my approach? Uh, not yet, because like I told you, it's an early project, uh, it's an early research project, but I, I expect that I will be able to run this experiment soon. And, and, and to publish the results <laughs> to the academic community. I hope so. <laughs> yes, thank you. I think this is the last question that we received. Just a second, I will check if there isn't. But yeah, just making sure, okay. And, and we are exactly on time. Thank you so much for your presentation. Professor Mika would like to, to make any question. Uh, thank you very much, Adriana. Very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for very efficient sharing of this last session of the doctoral consortium. Just very brief uh, closing remarks from my side. Uh, so I'm deeply convinced and uh, I'm sure that everyone who participated in this uh, consortium or, or followed it uh, has this conviction uh, that the quality of uh, the uh, submissions that were presented here um, create a basis for a very optimistic uh, prediction for further development of the uh, AI and law community. So we'll be looking forward to the further development of your field projects. Uh, and for sure, uh, we will intend uh, to organize another edition of the Dutural Consortium attached to the next edition of the AI conference. Uh, it is uh, particularly uh, pleasant uh, when uh, um, a student who already presented a preliminary version of the project during the uh, doctoral consortium then presents an advanced, almost finished version uh, on, on other occasions. I think that there is one very visible tendency uh, in the slate of papers that were submitted to this year's edition, namely, uh, there is a growing area or growing domain of uh, law of AI um, uh, research. Uh, that is uh, research which is less focused on computational data analysis or logical modeling, but rather on uh, societal, empirical, or uh, legal doctrinal analysis of uh, artificial intelligence solution and the related, uh, the related topics. Uh, and uh, this tendency has been apparent uh, for some time now. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for submitting to the doctoral consortium. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for excellent presentations, uh, all participants for interesting questions uh, for discussion. Thanks again for the supporting team for your Excellent help. And uh, in 10 minutes or so, we will be joining the general closing session of the ICAIL uh, 2021 conference. Thank you very much. Then we will also announce uh, the recipient of the Doctoral Consortium Best Editor Award. Thank you.